Welcome to episode 92 of Talking Landscape Photography. And uh, we've got a very special guest. We always say that, but uh, this is very personal for me. It's one of my, my dearest friends in the world for a good 15, maybe 18 years or so already. So he's, he's going to remain a mystery for now because Luke and I are going to have a little chinwag about what we've been up to. So Luke and I have been working on a very special project for a few years, actually, that we've had to keep completely under wraps. And we won't reveal what it is right now, but we had a very special culmination where we spent two, almost two full days filming. Um, I did a lot of video. Um, Luke did this incredible drone work. We did a mixture of stills. I did some amazing portraits. And we'll, we'll treat this as a teaser moment because we're having a meeting actually straight after this about uh, if or when it's now available to for us to talk about it publicly. Um, but it's a historical project and it has great reference from the maritime kind of point of view that's a little cue and uh, it has a connection to new zealand actually funny enough um so yeah a little little teaser but that's taken up a lot of our uh, time in the last week i um i very unusually flew into melbourne and back in the same day yesterday which i don't think i've ever done uh not the car most carbon friendly thing but it was the only thing i could uh pull off because i'm actually packing to go to new zealand tomorrow i can't wait to see what they came up with with that by the way that that would be um... yeah I've, I've never had this look i had it's so basically um i've been engaged with the epson panel awards for as a judge and an entrant over quite a few years and epson wanted and and david evans wanted to create some amazing material with people they feel like have a good relationship with with the panel awards and so they've selected myself and Tom Pard and Mika Boynton and I think maybe and David himself. And it's like herding cats trying to get us all together. It was it was trying to do it all in one go and get us all to be in the same spot. It was impossible. Mika's already in New Zealand. Oh. Tom is doing God knows what. And then I ended up being the first one. So the whole film crew literally came all the way down from Sydney, spent an entire day doing um, location research of where they wanted to shoot. And then I literally had 10 hours of filming yesterday with – two videographers it's just in my grill all day it was it was quite an experience it was really fun and it was really full on i was up at four and uh touching touching soil on the first flight in melbourne and doing interviews and uh with two hours sleep and then racing around uh all different spots of east and west and and down the peninsula in melbourne and then this race straight to the airport so it's like it was pretty hectic but pretty amazing and uh i've got a meeting today also about being a presenter at the APP um, conference, the Australian Photographic Prize, uh, also under Epson's banner, which is pretty exciting. And there's an incredible range of speakers there. And from what I can see, it's probably easily going to be the premier event in Australia this year for photography in terms of the breadth of both physical print judging as well as, you know, days of incredible speakers and community. And some of it we stream live, um, but it's, yeah, it's sort of mid-September. And it's I'm really excited to have an opportunity to get to get our community back together. We there's a big loss losing the RPP and having the awards. And this isn't necessarily trying to reproduce the same thing at all, but a lot of the same amazing people are involved in its organization. Um, but it's gonna be pretty magic. And then I'm literally hitting the ground running in New Zealand uh tomorrow. Haven't been home for three years to see my family, thanks to COVID. And uh, good old mum's pretty pretty excited to see me at least. And my my nephew's got a scholarship to um, Berkeley University in California, so I'm going to be schooling him up and doing a surf trip on the Saturday with him. And because uh, I used to live um, just down the road from Berkeley, and I've got a few clues to get him up to speed for all the cool spots and places and what to watch out for. But um, yeah, and then I'm going to be judging the New Zealand Photography Awards. Um, which is always an absolute delight, and there'll be a few cool Aussies over there too. So just you really, at all, though, really have you <laughs> yeah community and family i'm really excited to engage in both and the, to me they're two of the most important things in life so um oh Luki, you how about yourself mate you've done a few crazy late night runs and yeah, various yeah well I, i'm i've had a major project um i don't know if i can say who i'm doing it for but um yeah it's a, a, a company that i very much um enjoy working aren't we with. the secret squirrel club tonight mate? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Well, I, you know, it's one of those things, you know, it's not really my, my project to talk about in, in some ways, but um, yeah, it's, I've been asked to do an astrophotography project and, and going out and shooting astrophotography uh, on demand is actually quite a challenging thing to do and very stressful because you really only have specific times, you know, when, when it's clear 
and um so you know, if you have a weather. week of bad weather and you've got a specific time frame you need to have all of the content done by it can be quite stressful and thankfully um there was a an evening recently where i was able to go on a drive and and had some really clear conditions um and was able to to pull off some of the shots that i had been planning for so long so um, one, one of lucky's really, epic all night crash in the car for a few hours and come home drive section yeah side. well i mean sort of have to do what you have to do and at the moment uh you know the the milky way core is setting off into the west um quite early in the morning about three in the morning so the the best shooting is kind of right after sunset when the core is sort of still in the eastern sky a bit and then you, you know then it's directly overhead it's quite hard to compose into images when it's directly overhead and then um you know three in the morning is never really an appealing time to be taking photos but that's generally when the milky way cores about 25 degrees um off the western horizon down here in tassie so and that's a really good angle for it to fit into composition so um you just have to do what you have to do unfortunately to get these shots but um you know when you're sitting out under the stars and can look up and see the milky way with the naked eye um you know, and you're on your own, just enjoying that. Yeah, that, um, that time on your own is pretty, pretty amazing thing to be quite able to special, do. Isn't it? Time lapses and star trails are running away. So, so um, yeah, so that's been busy, busy, busy. But um, you know, that's um, all part of the all part of what I do. I'd love to have more time to do my own work, but um, you know, you've also got to pay the bills. So it's um, for, definitely one of the ironic things. I think I certainly did a lot more of my own shooting when I worked full time for someone else. When I work for myself, I'm working for other people. So it's a bit of an inversion, but um, yeah. when you're out there doing what you love to do. Um, you, uh, you know, all of that falls away anyway. So. Uh, well, our, our, our guest can speak to a bit about that uh, himself, actually. So the final reveal, my my dear friend uh, Toby Story. He's a, a Tassie-based. Um, geez, where do we even start? Um, High-end adventurer um, runs and he's a CEO of an international uh, um, sea kayaking adventure company, um, which we are going to speak to a lot about tonight. And right back in the day, Toby was my assistant for a lot of the the wedding work that I used to do. <laughs> Lots of. Next thing you know, I was like, oh, Tobes, can you, can you climb that 24 tree and get a shot up there? And he'd be like, no worries, be up there like a monkey. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, he's he's trained and studied in photography and it's a deep passion of his. It's not a career path of his, but um, because he's been such an exceptional guide and he's guided, I don't know how many countries all around the world, uh, heavy focus on sea kayaking in particular. And having been a sea kayak guide myself for 17 years and actually some of the best trips I've ever done have been with Toby. We did an incredible loop around the... Um, Wilson's prom for five days once, which which still stands out to me is just one of the most amazing sea kayak experiences I've had for the range of conditions we had and the and the quality of company we had too, actually. Absolutely amazing, Ben. Mm. So so there'll be a little bit of humor about my and Toby's relationship, actually. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry about that, Paul. <laughs> and they'll come through the show tonight and uh and that's fine. And Lukey and I and Toby have also worked together before. Uh, and that's actually partly how um, Toby uh, was introduced to Luke. And so there's there's already these interesting loops and parallels. And and given the strength of that pre-existing relationship and um, and where Luke and I are at in terms of um, getting really excited about getting leaning into the, the travel windows that we have for more international based um, shoots and projects and workshops, we're we're actually aligning up to do an amazing workshop um, in a polar region in, in the Arctic with Toby. And so we're not here to spruik that tonight. We're, we're here to lean into Toby's incredible level of experience in polar regions, both north and south, and his very, very great depth of skill in terms of preparing and educating people to know how to approach going on more adventurous travel um, trips. And also he has free reign to share the kind of trips he runs and operates as a leader now. And uh, as we get later in the show, we might get a little bit more specific about what uh, what Toby and Luke and I are looking to put together for you. Um, just, so just being uh, really upfront about that. So we're going to have fun. We're going to be a bit conversational. Um, Toby's got a presentation to start for us. And it's going to be a little bit about his, his journey as a photographer and, and then lean into just giving us all an opportunity. And Luke and I are going to be the little kind of the kind of birds on the side that ask all the, the kind of questions that he normally probably has to answer every day um, as a, as a CEO, 
But I guess the reason we wanted to do that is one, because Luke and I can learn a few extra things as well. Um, we're not shy on doing adventures in our own lives, but at the same time, Toby has a lot more polar experience in particular than um, certainly myself. Luke's done Luke's done a chunk in, in the Arctic. Um, and also we wanted the show to kind of empower people and educate people that if at any time in their life they wanted to uh, invest and, and really go on a, a pretty more extreme uh, environment adventure that they feel a lot more prepared and empowered to do so. Yeah, maybe demystifying also, it too. So they yeah, demystifying it. You know, what is it like being on these polar boats? You know, what are the, what's the physical reality of the kind of equipment I need to be prepared for, the kind of conditions I might be facing, what it might be nice to maybe research in before I go in terms of animal behaviour or the kind of lens choices that I might take on a trip like this. And what we have really, really uniquely is we've got someone that's so experienced that that literally can give us all these detailed real life examples or stories of what it is actually like. And you know, and the child many times too, not just um, you know, just not a handful of trips sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a it's it's a show about photography, but it's also, to be honest, it's probably more about empowering you to take on a, a photographic adventure in a, in a more extreme polar environment in particular. And by the end of the show, and as we go through, we'll probably lean a little bit more into the Svalbard area, which is which is where one of Toby's and, and our trip is going to be aimed to be focused on. But outside of that, regardless, this show is is more about just giving you insight into into making, yeah, educated choices and, and getting inspiration about um, going on such an amazing adventure like that. So, Toby, all I can say is don't embarrass me too much. <laughs> oh, hey, everyone. And uh, Luke and Paul, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's, it's um, yeah, it's really cool. It's great to be here and just sort of share a bit of time with you guys. Um, I've known Paul, I don't know, yeah, it's sort of hard for me to picture when we met, how we met, it just has always been there. Um, we spent a lot of time surfing together. We still share a lot of waves. You know, was, we always chat about surfing. And um, we got epic waves last week. Actually, one of the best seasons I've had in I don't know how many years. It was that good. I spent a lot of time swimming, but yeah, Paul got some very good waves. Probably got and, uh, smashed for like an hour. <laughs> and then a kilometer uh, out to sea in a big open bay while I was getting barred off my nuts. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, yeah, it's true. It doesn't always happen that way, does it, Paul? No, I was no, no, I got I got lucky that time. I got I got the I got the long end of the stick, and he got the short short end on that 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 mission. Yeah, and we've done we've done a lot of photography together over the years. I sort of, I think, uh, God, I remember always bumping into Paul back in the uh, the camera shops in Hobart when we we're getting our film developed. You know, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been shooting there. I've got hundreds of shots to you know run through and um you know, that's 15 years ago plus and uh, yeah easy it's all sort of moved on from there but yeah it was a definitely uh, oh, I, actually, I remember having my celebratory party for when i won um i think the first time tasmania for talk of the year and it was at your house i remember that and i got in i got in big trouble because i turned up late to my own party celebration because <laughs> i started put this thing slideshow like together for all the photos <laughs> and, and everyone's like where the hell's paul like isn't this for him and i was like <laughs> If you spend time with Paul, you'll know Paul is always in the moment, which is a wonderful thing, and the moment able baby. to share his uh, time with with you when when you're there with him. So, but sometimes that means he's not always on time, but that's okay. <laughs> Poly time, <laughs> um, mate. Poly time, Poly time. Um, yeah, so I guess just as Paul gave me a nice introduction, which is lovely. Um, I it's hard to know where to start. I guess the first thing I want to say, obviously, this is a f photographic kind of uh, show. So it's about photography. I, it's hard for me to call myself a photographer, although I have uh, always had a camera with me, you know, 25 years. Um, I've, I have studied photography. I've um, you I've did spent a lot of time with the camera. A year, at, um, a year at TAFE, Topes? Is that yeah, right? I did a year, year at TAFE, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the stuff we did there. You used to um, rope, rope me in on shoots. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> every now and again. And um yeah, but you know, I have uh, I have focused on photography. It's been a passion of mine for for many years, and um, still something that follows me wherever I go. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, my main kind of profession um, is guiding, so expedition guiding in remote locations, um, primarily as a sea kayak guide, um, but also guiding in polar regions on expedition vessels. And um, that's yeah, I've sort of come around come all the way around back to that and um 
now I have my own company, a company that I worked for for many years and um, am sort of launching back into the world post COVID and uh, we're doing a lot of really fun and exciting stuff. So I might just share a, a presentation I've got and just sort of start running through some images um, and just talk a little bit more about, yeah, the polar regions and uh, where that sits for me and what, what we're doing in that space. So here we go. We got that up and running, guys? Up yep. and running. Love it. Yeah, so the business, you know, I have a company. It's called Southern, Southern Sea Ventures. Um, we run a, a lot of kayaking programs around the world. Um, what I kind of want to run through today is uh, my background and experience primarily in the polar regions, um, what those experiences are like for people generally, um, and really hoping that uh, Paul and Luke will engage with me a bit and ask me a few pointed questions to draw some information out of me. It's um, something I've been doing for 15 odd years. Um, so sometimes I sort of forget what it's like to be right at the very beginning and what it's like when it's your first time. But yeah, really hope that I can kind of uh, share some of that information with people about what it's like to be there, what sort of experiences you can have and what great photographic opportunities there are and just how the whole sort of system works, how it's accessible or not. Um, and yeah, what, what you might expect. I think um, as oh, I'll just switch across here. So Toby, yeah. what, when you're talking about, I mean, we're probably jumping ahead to, actually, no, I'll come back to that later. I was going to ask you about polar bears, but we can do that down the track. <laughs> oh, polar bears. I and mean, we've got to talk about them, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. very briefly, yeah. like just so, yeah, my, my business, um, which is my, my life at the moment, is um, a sea kayak specialist company, basically, um, with a bit of with a separate arm that's also also does polar small ship polar cruising. Um, we've got, uh, I think, twenty three different uh, sort of trips on offer around the world. Um, we've always focused on doing sort of multi day trips in remote locations, and that's kind of where my uh, expertise and experiences has come from in uh, different places from the Mediterranean to, to the tropics, to Tasmania, the polar regions. Uh, it's all sort of part of my life and of travel and adventure and um, has given me great opportunities to go places and, and capture some, some really great images as you well. You must have seen some incredible things, especially from the water and angles that most people would never see. It's Tom, something. Tom, if you go, can you go back to that, that page? Yeah, for sure. Um, can you quickly just tell us where these are? Yeah, like, sure. so, bottom left. Is that like Thailand or somewhere? Or? Uh, so top left, so I first think. image coming from the left-hand side, um, that is in um, Papua New Guinea, so oh, wow. far west of PNG. Um, and then we've got Ningaloo, so we've got the Ningaloo Reef, which is the camping little tented one. Uh, oh, yeah. Directly to the right of that is um, in Italy, in the Cinque Terre, oh, that's so it is. Mediterranean region. Uh, top right corner is a shot um, from Greenland um, in a place called Red Fjord near Rodo or Red Island, um, a place where a lot of icebergs get trapped. I can come back to talking a bit more about that. Bottom, on the bottom, we've got the tropical one that's uh, in Rajarampit, which oh, is the yeah. western side of, um, of New Guinea, so West oh, yeah. Papua. Um, and then uh, we've got a shot from Antarctica with a, a whale, a humpback whale surfacing right next to a right next to a kayak. So just some of my favourite shots from different parts of the world that um, I've visited. Yeah, yeah. I, there's probably so many stories about each of those individual, individual photographs too. Like, oh. like some of those places. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New Guinea sort of has always had a bit of an edge to me. Like um, in terms of just how wild the, it's just so culturally sets apart i think in the world you know it's it's still got a lot of its root culture intact and and there's some super wild really accessible areas and we'll have to do it and, uh, find us find someone we can yeah we might have to do i i would love to do one on that area actually maybe the <laughs> deepest fight a little bit for me personally <laughs> because <laughs> I've, I've had a few opportunities to go a few times and I, it hasn't happened but i've always been a bit on edge about it i i've, I've traveled there a little bit and um the west the coastal environment is very the coastal people are very different to the to the highland people the and highland people yeah there's a lot more turmoil in in the highlands just just to be frank and um yeah 
I felt, always felt safe on the coast and um, my interactions with people there have been incredible, friendliest people I've ever met. But um, it does feel tumultuous in the, in the highlands and it, it's a little bit, it feels a bit unsettling to me. But, the, um, but yeah, I've had some of the most wonderful experiences of my life with, with people in those areas. Something pretty special. Yeah. So that's uh, southwest corner of Tassie, is that right? Yeah. So these photos, you know, yeah, just I'm pretty sure I send it up on your wall in private place. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess it's sort of one of those images that got me, I don't know, like just, you know, my, my image making kind of started with my travel, you know, so me moving from place to place and just journeying and having the camera with me. I did a lot of solo travel um, in my early years, you know, from 18 to 20 something um, and taking photos was, you know, a way for me to engage with the place, but also a way for me to share my experiences with people back home. Um, and over time, I kind of, you know, I snagged a couple of good ones, I guess. And the one on the left there is, is just a, a shot, an early morning shot in Melbourne airport. Um, and the one on the right there is, is South Cape. So right on the Southern coast of Tasmania, um, some friends and I, did a sea kayaking trip, paddling out, paddling some a group of boat, boats with a group of us, just friends back from Port Davey. So is that Southwest Cape or South East Cape? That is uh, South Cape, so right at right yeah, in, in the middle. Rock. Oh, in the middle. Oh, yeah, right. the middle of the South yeah. Coast. Yeah. So gotcha. Yeah. I thought it was one right of the corners. Yeah. Yeah. No. So we passed around the Southwest Cape and passed, and you know, weren't quite at South East Cape, but. We had this. Okay, so if you didn't, if you didn't know, that's a that's a very significant trip to undertake. Very and remote. As in, very a lot remote. of open ocean ships don't even get through that trip, let alone uh, kayaks. So, <laughs> where did, where did so, you um, yeah. uh, finish up with that one? Just out of interest. Sorry. Where did you finish up? Like, if you start at Port Davey, um, did you uh, we, to Southport or something? So I've done it twice. The first time I did it um, with 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 a mate. I was up in Launceston, and we'd been talking about doing it, and weren't sure when and then we looked at the weather and he goes what are you doing tomorrow i'm like <laughs> nothing and we're like all right well let's go so anyway i drove home packed did some shopping drove to the airport in cambridge and we flew into the southwest the pilot would happen to be running a day tour so he gave us a lift out to the heads of port davy because he and i had guided down there for years and years so i thought oh we'll just you know if we can get a lift we'll take that paddled left paddled around the corner so paddled down around southwest cape um, got to Southwest Cape on sunset. We'll just, we'll just stop there for a second. So, so that yep. corner is open to some of the wildest oceans on planet Earth. And the west coast of Tasmania has recorded 22 metre swells. So, so when he says pop down to the corner, it's like <laughs> for a lot of people that's potentially a life-threatening uh, choice to make um, that many people don't have the courage to do. I mean, if you pick the weather timing properly and you've got the skills that Toby has and uh, – and some friends of his that are just game enough to come along, um, uh, then anything's possible. But but yeah, just just he, that's the kind of thing that somebody at Toby's school level it would just say pop around the corner. And to most people, that's like probably won't ever even consider doing that in their life for many very good reasons. But um, yeah, I, I just needed to qualify that a little bit. Thanks, Paul. It is hard to put it into context, but yeah, we sort of got to Southwest Cape there on dark which meant we had to make a landing on a remote beach in the dark, um, which neither of us had been to before. And we, anyway, we, as we're paddling in, we're like, Oh, better check. Is there any, you know, rocks or anything? And then we heard the waves breaking behind us. So we just went for it and um, yeah, it was all good. But the next morning we got up and um, in the dark and paddled out, paddled basically the whole South coast. It's about 70 kilometers, 75 kilometers and uh, landed. And then the next day, paddled around Southeast Cape, which is the southeast corner. We bumped into some abalone divers um, who were going back to Hobart and said, oh, we can give you a lift if you like. So <laughs> they drove, popped the boat in, you know, popped the kayak in their boat, put it in the trailer on the back of the car, drove us home. We left Monday at 8 o'clock and we were back at home by Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. with our feet up. Uh having a glass of, having a beer and um so that's that, normally like normally like a week-long trip isn't it yeah so it was it, it just all happened very quickly we got the right weather window and all these sort of things came into line but we went back and did it again i went back and did it again with a bigger group uh, just of friends and we took 12 days took our time and popped along the coast and so this was a long day it's about 40 oh, kilometer 
mm. paddle between one landing site and the next. And the light was just, you know, fantastic. So snag this. And yeah, so it's got a lot of personal memories, but it'll say, you know, I like yeah. it as a photo as well, of course. So, you know, no, I, so when, I, when I when I go visit Toby, there's a few of these images that are on his walls and <laughs> There's some quality to the particular images that, that Toby's created that you can spend a lot of time with it. And, you know, the ones you have, you know, of the Arctic regions at home as well, Toby, that there's a beautiful ethereal quality to all of those that every time I go back, I can just stay with and spend time with and appreciate um, in, in a slow kind of beautiful, elegant sort of way. Like, um, yeah, when I think back of every time I've, I've seen them, it's it's and even when I've seen them multiple times. So there, there's quite a timeless aspect to some of your um some of your printed work, Toby, that I know you're aware of. Um, and so Toby used to be used to be a guide in Port Davy as well. So he used to run sea kayaking trips within. So Port Davy is a very very remote area in the southwest of Tasmania that's not accessible by road at all. You can only either fly in or do a very long edgy trip on a boat to even get into that area so just to give or it a paddle. context yeah, or, paddle. Or, or paddle yeah. it's a long paddle yeah, yeah. So again so we talk about port davies being something down the road it actually is quite a remote destination that most people in the world will never get to mm. so yeah, it's, it's very work i've been there and it's it's yeah. just completely stunning it's um mm. yeah, definitely yeah you want to get that sense of being in a magic place on your own Oof. Oof. And you worked for Roaring Forties as a guide out there for a long time, Tobes. Is that right? Yeah. So I was down there for six summers, um, you know, spending many months down there at a time, off and on, you know, flying backwards and forwards uh, for a kayak company uh, called Roaring Forties. Um, yeah. So that was kind of, that was the first area that I really got into my my guiding with. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I, um, I might talk about it later, but um, you know, I, just thinking of this, um, uh, the practicalities of of being a photographer, but also kayaking, because normally your hands are on a a paddle rather than on a shutter button. Um, I don't know if it's a good time, but um, you know, how how do you actually make that work? <laughs> oh, look, funnily enough, <laughs> I've actually got something right here, which is probably going to help. This is my kit, right? <laughs> you know. Um, and basically, Pelly case with my camera inside, and I usually carry just a little a little rag or something for my hands because my hands are always salty. And I also always use um, you know zoom lens. You just you got to have the flexibility. There's no opportunity to change lenses on the water. Yeah. You know, you're rocking around this sort of thing. Is that something like a right? 24105 or something like that? Or... Uh, yeah. What have I got? Yeah. I have 28 to 300. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's not the highest quality, but it provides me the best opportunities for, for taking for doing imagery on on the water oh, that's right i mean you're already yeah. compromising um to you're going to have to compromise if you can't change lenses and you know if you've got uh you know some wildlife in the distance um that you know that's the the best option you've got so that makes exactly sense. yeah because yeah, you've got all that all the different opportunities there right in front of you so you have to be switching quickly between them yeah. and i guess I, you know the pelly think... case is easy to whip out and unclip and 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 you're away as well yeah so it just you know sits between my legs yeah in in the cat in the um you know right in there <laughs> right in my in my cockpit <laughs> sort of whip it out and pop it open quick snap 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 back in it goes you know yeah and, and you get you, you know you get you any, in whatever um, you do so that's kind of that's the way i that's the way i do it yeah i've done it i mean i've done a few moments or... <sighs> yeah. Have you, Sorry, Loki. Have you ever had any moments where um, you know it didn't quite work out and the camera got a bit a bit too splashed? Or look, yeah, it gets splashed a fair bit to be honest. And um, I just accept that this camera is my splash camera, yeah. and it is it is going to get wet and it's going to get salty, and that's just the cost of me taking images on the water. I've never, I just haven't been able to get away from that reality. And if you have a look. Oh yeah, okay. I'm here. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is embarrassing, but like, wow. See, I cleaned that just the other day, but it just keeps corroding. And this has gone for seven years. Wow. So, wow, you know, seven it's years. Still, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And it, you know, it's everything's still functioning. So it's uh, 
maybe it's only six years. This is another one, yeah. It's the Nikon D610, so it's full yep. frame. It's got um, great weatherproofing and it seems to have worked really well. So I just keep just keep going with it. I just keep using it. and um, But I've nearly dropped it twice. So I've like held, you know, just sort of had slipped in my hand, but I just managed to quickly grab Whoa. it. <laughs> and it just sort of went shoop, and swung past the water like that. But it, oh. I haven't yet dropped it. So, so do you, would you have a strap on it then or you just, yeah. you, you wouldn't, oh, you do. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I just keep this, I just keep the strap. And what I do is I actually, as I pull it out of the thing, I just twist it around my arm so yep. that I've got the strap right. on my arm yeah. like that and shoot, shoot, shoot. And, and then, I'm guessing you have to also make sure that, you know, you're in, you know, the weather's or the, you know, the water's nice and, you know, calm enough. You know, you don't want to be. Not necessarily. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not as calm when the, when the shots are coming coming into line, is it, Tobes? It's difficult to take shots when it's there's heavy rain or heavy wind. And, you know, my job is taking care of people on the water. So I have to focus on that first. But you get faster and quicker at, like, whipping it out in the opportune moments. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So some, sometimes you can literally raft up to a boat next to you and it creates a more stable platform. Mm. Uh, and that can be a way of, of getting around that a little bit. If you've got a re if you're in a double boat with a second shooter and to Toby's done this for me many, many times where I'm in the front of the boat, he's the engine at the back and I'm dropping my paddle every freaking 20 seconds to take a photo. So he's essentially doing all the work while I sit there having fun. But uh, there's a there's a great photo that uh, that you took, Luke. Actually, when I'm um, pretty sure it was you, when we were coming through the channel at Bruny Island doing a project together, and uh, of Toby's Sea Kiting Company um, out of the lagoon in Southern Bruny, and there's a section of breaking waves, and I was so in the moment we're taking photographs, I realised we were in the breaking waves before I realised, oh, my camera's still out. The waves are coming right at me. The pellet case is sitting there. I don't have time to put it in there. And there's a photo of me with my camera like way <laughs> over the top of my head as the waves are like smashing into my chest and my face when I'm trying to keep my camera from, from drowning. And I uh, I got away with it. Um, so it's kind of up to you how far you do that line. Um, I've done quite a few second trips with cameras as well. And a simple pallet case means it pretty much means you're committing to one lens. And sometimes on a longer trip, I might have several lenses packed away in waterproof gear at the bottom of the boat. And each day I might make a specific choice about what lens I want to have accessibility to while I'm paddling. And that might change, or I might just take a gamble. I'm going to go for a wider one today, or I'm going to go for a longer one today. But having uh, a, a, a zoom range that's quite broad is super helpful. I think another thing that I've done, Luke, um, is actually have I used to have a like a Canon G10 or G12 and actually yeah. bought the waterproof housing for it, so it does shoot like 20 megapixel raw photographs and it's a point and shoot and it's all sealed in. You don't have to worry about the weatherproofing and they're quite light. They're a bit bulkier by the time you put the cases on them, but your peace of mind around those is pretty yeah. high. Um, the other thing I've used quite a bit um, personally, not to take away too much from me, Tobes, but just to empower people yeah. with voices around. Um, Water-based environment photography is I have like an Olympus Tough, which is a fully waterproof point and shoot. And sometimes a photograph is more about the story and it's less about how many megapixels or, you know, like it, the power is in that moment, regardless of, of what resolution camera you take it on. So I find, and I have that literally in my pocket on my paddling vest there the whole time. So anytime I have a, I don't have a lot of a time window or it's a really sketchy environment for waves or, or splashing, I'll just lean on that. So at least I know I'm getting something that's usable, even though it might not be a two meter print. And so there's just levels of, of how you approach um, and what sort of equipment choices you use that give you more or less flexibility relative to the quality of outcome that you're after. And then of course, you know, when I get land, you can pull out the tripod and you get to these amazing places and, and we'll lean into that shortly because we haven't really talked about why sea hiking and what it enables you to do. But um, yeah, that, that's my little, little equipment based spiel, but it's worth kind of just sounding out with people what options there are. You could probably use a mobile these days too. They're getting so good and quite um, waterproof as well. So I don't think we're too yeah, far I, away from that being a reality. That, yeah, I, I was thinking like, yeah, that's that's a good option. And there are 
quite specific high caliber um water housings for phones now some of them even have like um grips down the bottom and they're designed to be like underwater cameras or surf based cameras and with a caliber you know you can get 4k 60p video out of out of modern phones so that can be really good video devices as well really? Client, what, sort of, what do your clients do toby like people that are they're quite interested in doing that line between photography and sea hiking i mean and you have a variation i guess of people because they're coming more for the adventure but i'm sure some of them have been pretty interested in photography what what kind of setups have you seen them go with and, and what do you sort of recommend to them yeah so a wide variety but oftentimes it is hard to to do you know focused photography from a kayak you know i, I managed to sort of snapshots and i get over time I, I found you know i get some nice ones but focusing on photography in a kayak is, is not always so easy. Um, and so a lot of people will um, just have a small point and shoot, something small in their uh, uh, PFD pocket, so a phone um, or some, a small Olympus Tough or some, something of that nature. Once you, if you're a bit more serious and you wanted to use an SLR, then yes, the kind of setup that I have with a, a small Peli case, a 13 or 1400, um and then a and or a dry bag and a dry bag you know you still have to wrap the camera in a in a towel or something just to provide some padding because you're sort of dropping and picking it up mm -hmm. dropping and picking it up so you can put that on the on the front or deck of your kayak um or you can put it in inside um yeah Does and then float too then if it falls off yeah as well? yeah, yeah that's it yeah so the, the, yeah, pet, the pet case or the the dry bag will will float you've got to get a good quality one yeah um and also it's you know i i tend to use really bright colored ones as well for that mm -hmm. reason because uh, you can get pillowcases cases that are black or yes. like army green and yeah, they'll be pretty hard to fall into the water <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's very true yeah and and then to be honest when people are really serious, you know, they often split it. Like if they're going to do, um, they want to be really serious about photography and have multiple lenses, then they won't do the kayaking side of things. They'll often be on shore or in, you know, for the, for the polar stuff on shore in Zodiacs um, for doing that shooting. The, um, but, and then when we're, when I'm running more expedition style trips, people have a photography bench, um you know it's good once you get to shore to pull out the, the bigger camera and maybe do some wildlife there or uh, bring a tripod on on land so mm. it, it just it, provides it, slightly it, different it, opportunities one of the aspects that uh yeah i'm quite familiar with um having been guiding you know doing trips for a long time myself is is uh as soon as you pull out a camera you're basically not moving anymore and mm. essentially unless you're on your own uh you've got either need to have extremely patient group <laughs> uh you need to have negotiated sort of time to do so or if you're especially lucky you get someone in the back that's happy to keep paddling along on a double kayak in particular uh, which is often how the more expedition based trips are run because mm. the, the double boats tend to be more stable and you've got two engines rather than one in terms of managing you know if the wind comes up and you got to push a bit harder and you can also get more equipment in the boats as well um but uh yeah having a patient friend in the back really makes a big difference first the first photographic sort of group i took down to port davy was actually um, a group from nat geo china oh wow and the interpreter came to me and he said oh the photographer said he wants to paddle with you so he can take photos it was a three-day trip and so he took photos and I paddled <laughs> and that's the best way to get, to get photos is to be in the front of a double with someone who's going to paddle you around and put I'm you in position. to hire you to do that then <laughs> yeah it, yeah it's good it, it is good fun yeah oh that's great well, it's really good to get those insights because it's something that I've certainly always uh, tried to get um around my head i suppose and i have had a go at it a few times i had a really lovely shoot on corinna and got on a kayak at sunrise but it's very easy to get um, um like little drops of water in the wrong places um it's just so you know the water is just so yeah it's up and you and don't see very, it and you know if yeah. you're a beginner you know the the vest you know it feels quite unstable a lot of the time and you know you pull mm. up your hands and then all of a sudden you're you're moving around so it's um yeah, or you, or you haven't put your uh, your paddle on the deck properly. And next thing you know, it's it's out in the ocean <laughs> somewhere, and you're like, "Whoops!" Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah quite, I, that's quite common. I always uh, clip the paddle on, you know, paddle leash, so that you can drop it if you need to. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. And, um, 
yeah, wipe but, them but, out. But, but the, so there, another reason why it's so great, though, is it's really dynamic. You're, you're almost at water level. Mm. And there's this really visceral kind of interactive, super engaged quality to be able to photograph like that. And it's quite different than, you know, being on the deck of a big polar boat. We're up high and it's all very stable. Like there's an edginess to it, but there's also a dynamism to it at being at that really low level. And it can really come through really beautifully in your images. Um, they do they're make good so subjects as well, the, the boats, you know, that they, they're quite, I find, you know, they. Yeah, they write great framing pieces. The nose mm -hmm. of the boat. They're very you, Instagrammable, actually. There's a very yeah. few accounts, like I think there's a guy that um, goes around the fjords of Norway and, um, you know, the classic red boat with the, the, with the front and then you know massive scene um of the cliffs behind and it, it's very instagram and that, yeah. <laughs> boats usually are quite colorful and that's mainly for visibility reasons as well mm. um just going back to that practical thing we'll, we'll move on to the next slide shortly um <laughs> there's, a re there's a reason why you need to have one of the smaller pelly cases and that's worth considering if you accidentally buy a bigger one because the actual deck of the boats is quite narrow and they're often quite curved and so there's only so much space that you can actually put the pelly case, which is generally in front of you because you're sealed into the boat with a skirt and a deck. And it's not advisable to be able to have to take that off to access something which you really can only sit between your legs. I have done that um, because if you suddenly tip over and you're not sealed into the boat, your boat's going to fill up with water and you're going to be in trouble. Whereas if you flip over for some reason and you're in the boat and you've got a few skills you could potentially roll yourself back up again without any dramas and just carry on so so having that smaller one right at the front which you can usually strap into some of the um combing straps that are on the deck that have elasticated uh systems that you can kind of often customize a little bit and that gives you it means it's right in reach and it's also if you roll a boat over it's still going to be there when you roll back up mm. there you go hopefully yeah <laughs> If you if you can roll, <laughs> if you can roll, yeah, definitely important. You know that that spray skirt that Paul's talking about from a comfort perspective, it really um, keeps you warm as well and um, and dry and yeah. dry prevents yeah you getting splashed down a little bit. So, Let's keep moving I'm moving sure through there. Yeah, you want me to do well. a few more slides? Um, Why not? Why not? Yeah, sure. So we digress, but this is yeah, good. No, it's, it's great. Good the to, um, good to get it. I guess the, they just put these two photos up because they were sort of before study. They were just photos that I took uh, on the move. And, you know, I sort of was like, yeah, you know, maybe I'm not a bad photographer. You know, maybe I should go and become a photographer. So I went off and I studied uh, photography for a year and just tried that out. You know, I'd been guiding for maybe six or seven years and um, I thought, oh, you know, I'll try something new and different. And um, I sort of got into all different types of photography. So I did a bunch of street photography. This is actually um just shots in new york that i'd done and just looking at texture and color and light and um patterns and you know activity i i, I remember it was interesting for me because because i had never studied and toby was studying at the same time and i was kind of like oh should i be doing that and i was sort of over the shoulder oh what are you doing this week toby oh what sort of equipment is that oh i've never done lighting before can i come in and have a look so there was a bit of a parallel between the two of us while, while toby was doing that um because yeah I've, I've gone the solo route in terms of just life experience and and toby i definitely was peeking over your shoulder quite a bit there during that time times <laughs> yeah well you know i mean yeah i've learned a lot just by working with paul obviously but just yeah by working side by side with someone who just takes a lot of images you it's really where i found you learn so much so but technically it was useful you know and, and i guess looking at other people's work you know it's just a space you know for study time was a space to, to look at other people's work and think about it critically and also pick up a few you know a few sort of technical skills on the um processing side of things and uh i did a little bit of studio work and lighting which we'll get to in just a second but um you know travel photography sort of always stayed with me you know i spent some time in indonesia i lived over there for a while and I just go walking through the hills of Jogjakarta, uh, meet people and chat and take photos. Was it half, was it half a year, Tobe? So I'm trying to remember. I was living in Jogjakarta for six months, so that's um, central um, Java. It's so Java. The most populous, second most populous place in the world. Um, people everywhere, but it's a beautiful countryside and you know wonderful people. Um, yeah, and also in Lombok, which is uh, the next island across from. 
from Bali, I lived there for a little while as well. It was all studying. I was studying Indonesian, um, but also just going surfing and taking photos. So having a really great time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sort of after, you know, after after study, you know, a year of study, you know, what am I going to do? And of course, inevitably ended up doing weddings. And uh, <laughs> there's a, <laughs> this is, uh, I did a bunch of weddings with Paul. Actually, I was Paul's trusty assistant. So I would, as he said, climb the tree to get the different angle or jump up the ladder or, um uh, bring out the hold the flash or whatever and we had a lot of fun we did a bunch of yeah, a bunch did. of different shoots together in different places and i even um did a little bit of studio work with oh. the... <laughs> uh, this is i think i think the nice one too paul there was some pretty... <laughs> oh i know man oh, but, you know... I, I can't remember this shit. this must have been more than it what 12, 12 years ago or something oh my god no gray hairs so yeah no hairs. Oh, have you paul look at that yeah i thought the same guys it's a miracle i've just got a slightly more of a beard i was rocking looks like i've got the old um Hitler Mo going on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was into the goatees right, back yeah. in the day rather than the full beard. So this was one of my like, oh, what's the studio photography business times? I've never done it before. So oh, I'll do it, mate. Coming for a shoot, and I get roped into doing this. And we just sort of played around with lighting and stuff. But you know, for me, inevitably, I guess the wilds called. You know, and and um, I just ended up back guiding. Um, not just it was. It's just been. It's been a great passion of mine. You know sharing remote places with people and just the opportunities for travel really. And I just kept, I just always took the camera with me and, and kept photographing. And, you know, this photo on the left here was one of the most beautiful pieces of ice that I've ever seen. It was in, in Antarctica and it just, Remarkable. it obviously been worn down yeah. over time and you can see the different coloration in it. And that's because the ice is cracked and then the water's melted and meltwater's filled it. And that meltwater is, uh, is much denser. It doesn't have any air trapped inside it. And so then uh, it makes these beautiful blues and greens as opposed to the lighter um, ice, which has more air, is compacted snow and uh, ends up being a white colour. So this is obviously broken off the front of a glacier. The one in the middle is just a, you know, a moment between uh, a stop on, on a pre-dawn paddle, you know, somewhere in in the Whit Sundays and and the far right images, um, one I took in Greenland, um, you know, somewhere probably towards midnight under the midnight sun. So you're looking at that central photograph, wondering what's around the waist. That is actually the waist skirt that you wear oh. when you paddle. And <laughs> it's straight. It's sort of like, is this a, is this guy a donkey? Or what? <laughs> but uh, just just to clarify that, uh, so it, it stretches out in front of you as a combing sort of and and seals you into the deck and keeps the keeps the water out and and keeps the warmth and and that's just the the paddle vest that he's wearing on, on the on the top. Um, so what what I find incredibly striking with the image on the right, I, I don't think I've really seen any image like it, to be honest, with that combination of that pure snow-driven glacial, you know, feature um, with kind of misty fog, with like the edge of a sunset, you know, with like, what's that on the top right? Is that the edge of a cloud? Is that more snow? What's oh, the... That is, that's the ice cap. So that's oh, actually... Yeah. The ice cap itself. So there's so many layers to that image. Yeah. And it's, it's really arresting and very unique from what i've seen toby to be honest hmm. and that ice oh my god just let oh, me find it. Incredible. oh my lord and yeah. just the figure of the woman or the it's, it's almost like she's standing with her hands up and just you know touching something or pushing something along it's it's so metaphorical as well as just being incredible just um you know with just how it is without even leaning into that aspect of interpretation Far out. Mm. <laughs> pretty rare to come across those kind of styles is it is it just as likely in the arctic and the antarctic is it you just get lucky they don't last very long or they're only in certain areas that they have a certain weather pattern that cracks the ice open what's the what's the go um, with that just well I, I, i've got a few more images a bit further down the line that are just talk a little bit more about the different sort of types okay. of ice but really uh ice um there are different there are differences in the ice that you will experience in the different polar areas um, and they're always there and they're always varied so you know no matter where you go you're going to find amazing opportunities with the ice um, really a great diversity in the coloration and the shapes and the sizes and all of those sorts of things so 
Awesome. But I'll just flick through just a couple more. I mean, it just in terms of, yeah, really like my photographic stuff, it just ended up being, you know, an opportunity to continue to document my, my life and my experiences and uh, just fun. You know, I just sort of went back into doing it for fun and, and um, my income came from, from working as a guide and, and this just sort of traveled with me as I, as I went and just really well, briefly. I don't know what I remember one stage, so you, you're getting a lot more serious about trying to generate income from your photography. And I remember you going, being over your shoulder again when you sort of beat me to the punch and moving into different prints and different card structures and different ways of selling things. And yeah, you, you certainly had, a, had a, a good look down that pathway, I thought. Yeah, no, I mean, I had a couple of exhibitions and I was doing, um, you know, selling gift cards <laughs> and uh, started my website, Story Images. Um, which is hidden away these days, but um, oh, come on. And I did a, did a lot of printing on glass actually. So ceramic um, baking. So a baked, you know, you got images basically print on, you bake the image onto the back of a glass. It's sprayed on, on a ceramic dust and then is baked um, and with a beautiful translucent flavor um, look, which to me was really special for these uh, Arctic and polar um, areas because it just it was luminous you know and the ice is luminous and the, the light is the, what makes this this subtlety so beautiful you know, i guess the glass you know has that kind of transparency or um kind of mm. like the ice does too so it sort of engenders that yeah yeah good point like it has that kind of sense of luminosity and, and glow in it because there's a real subtlety to some of the arctic work that the separation of tones can be really very subtle at times oh like i know that um, oh, sorry paul there you go. Um, I know that um, like a lot of the time when they print on acrylic blocks, they can call them ice blocks as well. So mm. there's um, uh, there you go. an established thing there. <laughs> so, so if you go back one slide. Yeah, sure. So when you're talking about, when I was talking about that really visceral kind of quality, like to me, that image really speaks to that. Like you're basically, you can feel your hand just touching that water, you know, because mm. you're literally so close to it from that angle. Um, and literally when you get a bit of swell, you know, like those boats might disappear and then pop up. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, it's an unusual angle to get. There's probably no other way to get it, especially out in the open ocean than, than being on a sea kayak. Mm. Mm. And just types, why, why we're talking about sea kayaking in general is yeah. like, why sea kayaking? Like, I mean, it's, there's some obvious points, but I mean, to me personally, it's a lot of, it's about being out of reach and access places. There's almost no other way to get to, but what, but what is it? What is it for you? Like you know, it's obviously dominated a huge part of your life. You, you see it as an incredible platform for exploring remote places. Why is that? Oh well, I guess um, I'm a surfer, and I was I got into bushwalking. So I you know, grew up on the coast, loved the coast, very physically active. So I like doing active things. Sea kayaking just became a real way to combine all those things. So for me, it was expedition paddling is where I started. So. That meant you loading everything into the kayaks um, and traveling through the landscape. You're traveling at a slow pace, a bit like walking, but you're on the water. Um, and it kind of gives you that opportunity to interact with the coastline in a way that very few other mediums do. Um, small boats like Zodiacs, I, I find are quite similar um, in that regard, like you're, you're you, you've got a very shallow draft, so you can sort of move through small rock features. Um, you can get up close to, to wildlife. Wow. Um, and that, but yeah, so for kayaking, for me, it was just that that's the medium that, that sat with me. And I get also, when I first moved to Tasmania, I met a group of people who were really into sea kayaking, and that was a community that became a community. Um, and so that really kick started it for me and um, just. I saw the opportunity to go guide and around the world and yeah, got completely drawn into it. So, um, and it just, yeah, it has actually dominated my life. Like the bug bit you in a way and you know, that, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and it just kept opening new doors, you know, like, so I went to a guided in Port Davie, that's this top right image. Um, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but top right image, you know, I was guiding there for six summers, but intermittent, I was also in the off season, I go to Fiji um, we go guide in the Asawa Islands, uh, multi-day trips. And then eventually I ended up, you know, about five, six years later, I ended up guiding in the polar region. So I was on board um, small vessels, taking groups on, you know, excursions off the, the polar ships. Um, and then 
that that was my business, the business Southern Sea Ventures, you know, worked with them as well as some others. Um, and then in two, in 2020, March, I bought the business. January, I think I committed to the purchase and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but that really gave me the opportunity to focus in on developing trips um, here in Tasmania, which is somewhere I'm you know, very passionate about and travelled a lot and kayaked a lot. Um, and that's where a whole lot of this imagery came up um, between with that Paul and Luke and I all worked on. And that, that Paul central and Luke, image... Paul is... and Luke created. We, we just... Uh, that, we with you. that central image on the left is actually from that um collaboration so that's one of my shots um with toby being the engine in the back uh that i was shooting for to basically help support toby developing the tasmanian um aspects of, of his broader international company and uh luke was racing around doing epic drone stuff and i was i was on the water um on on all the sort of water-based sort of aspects of, of the trip but we got some yeah we got some beautiful work it was great mm, it was a fabulous shoot it was fantastic but yeah so um just sort of to jump ahead, I guess, you know, then oh. stunning image. Oh, <laughs> after how big is that, Toby? It looks like a freaking 25 story crazy. building or something like this. It's a big piece of ice. So, this is shot in Antarctica. Oh. It's a tabular iceberg. So, it's broken off one of the giant, giant glaciers. Um, and then it's sort of basically parked itself and is slowly breaking up. Oh, gosh, it's probably. Yeah, it's probably 50 metres, 60 metres, 70 metres high or something. Unbelievable. Yeah, 50, yeah. 50 to 60 metres would be that sort of height. Um, so, but, there's a good chance to speak about the, the Zodiacs a little bit more. Uh, I guess you've already alluded to a lot of their characteristics, like the quite the Zodiac oh, right there, right? Is in, in the bottom yeah, there's a Zodiac there. So That's it, yeah. They, they seem to be the tool of choice for, for most, um, particularly photographic-based sort of expeditions into polar areas. Do you want to speak a little bit more about how they work and... Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll come, I will come back to that in, in a bit more detail again, if, if need okay. be, but basically um, they carry, you know, a driver and usually eight or 10, up to eight or 10 individuals um, very comfortably, you know, they can travel quickly. Um, they're very safe boats. You know, they don't, they don't turn over. Very easily. Stable. They're very stable. Um and they cope with all kinds of, you know, they can bounce off the ice. They're very tough. They're made of very strong rubber. Um, and yes, fast through, fast through the water, stable. They ride really comfortably in a wide range of conditions. So they're just the perfect boat really for, for small group exploration. You know, so they're not too big. You don't have 20 people on the boat. You've only got a very small intimate group. They um, they're open on all sides. So you can always see, you know, and whether you're just on the Zodiac viewing or whether you're there as a photographer, um, you've always got the opportunity to view things. So, yeah, they're basically the boat of choice for... And very, very manoeuvrable, I imagine, as well. Very, yeah. very manoeuvrable, yeah. And you can land on, you know, you can land on a rock beach, you can land on ice, you can land on a, in a surf zone, you can land uh, just on a calm shore and you can pull up easily to, to a ship. So, yeah, they're, they're the perfect boat, you know, and they're, they're really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, in, uh, just about three months ago, I made the decision to charter a ship to go back to the polar regions, um, running kayaking, but also running um, just general cruising. And um, this is where our collaboration with Luke and Paul came in, where we're we're looking, we're running. They're going to run a workshop on the ship and do some photographic um, add-on to to the to the voyage as well. Um, the different I'm. Chartering in three areas, so uh, chartering in Antarctica, Greenland, and Svalbard, and we wanted to talk mostly just about Svalbard and what the sort of different experience is like there, and and what the place is like, and uh, what photographic so opportunities there are. If you if you understood geography, you realise that uh, Antarctica and Greenland are very different places. So, <laughs> so there, and the reason why that's significant is actually it's quite common for the same boats to run a season in the northern hemisphere and then run the rest of the season as as the weather shifts and the and the and the um the winters change uh, from one pole to the other and they move down and work on the other pole and so the, there's a cycle of them moving between one and the other which is a huge journey obviously and you know it was kind of a, i was kind of a bit curious at first when i realized that that happened that these these boats actually travel the entire planet one mm. to the other every year mm. 
they follow the migratory pattern of the Arctic tern, which is a small bird, no, probably around about 30 centimetres, <laughs> that will fly each year from the Arctic to the Antarctic to breed and feed. I'm which interested um, what the, the sort of date ranges are for, for like, I guess, the seasons uh, for, for polar exploration in both poles. Good point, yeah. Yeah, so May really is the start point for the season, you know, mid to late May is usually the beginning of the Arctic season. Um, through to early September um, and then you know late October through till mid-April is basically the Antarctic season or southern season and that gives the boats you know six weeks or something to move between the bottom and the top of the earth or the top and the bottom or how you know, long it actually one takes the other or would you really like to look at it is that how long it actually takes do you think oh. Yeah, you know, you've got to stop in, refuel, fix, you know, you've probably got to fix something, change crew, uh, repaint, you know, all the things that need to happen to a boat. It's very labour intensive, you know, managing and maintaining a, a ship. Absolutely, um, especially when it's going to someone so remote and, you know, you yeah. probably don't have the the parts and everything on hand otherwise. Yeah, and then you've got to... Really to the Australian ship, isn't it? Um, the Nyena, the the Anta Australian Antarctic Division ship, I heard, is offline for quite a period of time because they can't actually get particular parts from Russia. Oh, um, and so they're having to charter other boats to to you know they've just got this brand new vessel that they're, they're unable to use. So you know, the, the, just those sort of aspects are, are so important. Um, yeah, it's really complex. You know, the back the background. You know, the number of people. You know, you got. Oh, sort of 12 people 15 people on the vessel the whole time um managing the engine and the navigation and you know making sure everybody's fed you know not just mm. passengers that join the ship but obviously the crew and um keeping watch and just yeah it's a big it's a fairly big operation and then resupply you know you got to fill the boat up with food for for months on end and um so it's quite yeah time consuming sure. yes is there a particular base that that is is commonly used for for these kinds of vessels, or it's sort of all around the world that they sort of go in for that? that uh, it's all of... around the world. Yeah, it depends on where they're flagged um, and or where their sort of head of operations base is. Um, but they've got they've got sort of departure points, I guess, that are really common. Um, a lot of I guess a lot of they go into uh, sort of Poland, Finland, into that area for. Um, for, for refitting Poland is one of the main ports actually for refurbishment mm. um mm. so a lot of that work will happen up up there also in Miami um, mm. a lot of the port a lot of the ships go in there so it also just depends what other things they're doing you know maybe they're more of a cruise ship you know like the cruise ships you know they're like a you know 3,000 people um you it's a cruise you sit on the boat and you look out and um enjoy the kind of luxuries of the vessel versus like a expedition sh style ship which is sort of the end that i'm we're in where it's more focused on getting off and doing other things and being outside and then coming back to the ship as a place for safety and comfort um and those vessels have a different sort of life cycle uh, or movement pattern to mm. to some of those other cruise vessels you know they might go to the caribbean then and do their you know cruising the caribbean and casino yeah. tours and and the um the expedition ships will cruise back up to the Arctic or maybe go to Alaska or in the Northwest Passage or even the Northeast Passage, um, the Kamchatka Peninsula, Kirill Islands, although not at the moment. <laughs> yeah. um, that's everything kind of Russia in Russia is sort of off limits at the moment. Um, but that was a, a regular area that boats were, were traveling as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. But yes. Do you mind if I, should I jump on? Oh, yeah, yes. keep going. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, Svalbard, just where is it? <laughs> um, Svalbard is north of Norway. It's Svalbard uh, translates in Old Norse to the cold edge. So it's, it's basically the edge of the Arctic Ocean. It's the edge of the pack ice. It's really the, the southern extent of the um, the ice cap, the, the sea ice, Antarctic cap. Yeah. the Arctic uh, sea ice in winter. Oh. <laughs> um, and then it breaks, it'll break up in, don't worry, it's easy. Just so you know, no penguins in the north, no polar bears in the south, <laughs> and that'll take up take a couple of years to kind of remember that. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, yeah, so the Svalbard, the cold, the cold edge. So it really is like the the edge of the Arctic, um, seventy nine degrees north, so just a few hundred miles from the North Pole. Uh, it's dominated by um, sea ice, you know, pa the pack, 
Uh, so it makes it prime polar bear habitat, which is pretty special. Um, it's the main island is called Spitsbergen, uh, which is basically pointed mountains, so pointy mountains. So it's on the edge of the ice and it's point, the mountains are pointy um, and very apt descriptions. Some of the photos we'll see in a minute. It's um, probably was discovered by the Norse um, way back, you know, in the 800s or, or so, uh, but nothing really conclusive about that other than in the sagas, you know, they went to the cold edge. Um, and so this is this is probably where they've where they've gone. But of course, the Norwegians, because it's Norwegian, will say it was us. Uh, we were there first, and the Russians will say, "Oh, it was probably us." You know, we were out there whaling, and trapping, and hunting. And so, you know, had a had a history of European whaling in the 1600s. There's no indigenous population, um, unlike uh, Greenland and the rest of the, the Arctic. Um, it's you know been just a wildlife, an area of a, a real wilderness area. Um, so 1600s, we sort of had an extensive whaling there. Um, and then it's been a jump off point for the early polar explorers looking to traverse, you know, the, um, the ice and get to the North Pole, sort of in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and, and it was a place for trapping and hunting as well. So people would go there to, to get furs, so walrus fur, the walk so wal walrus hide polar bear fur reindeer arctic fox uh, that was a big part of the history there up until quite recently and, and that's obviously decimated the populations but that's changed obviously in the last few years and um, tourism is the main attraction and the animals in their 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 natural habitat is the main attraction and they're very well protected and looked after in a very different way now um, and obviously now sort of and my, went through a period of mining so there's a lot of coal up there um, and there, there, there has been a mining history there as well relatively recently. And now the primary reason for, to go there is, is for tourism. Mm, it's, what uh, sort of population uh, would just Toby. back on that previous one there, um, the, just noting just how far um, towards the pole it is because um, I remember that the top of Iceland is where the Arctic Circle actually is. So it's just so far into the into the Arctic Circle, just um, in Norway, you can see the Lofoten just the top there in the bottom center there as well. And that's just inside the circle, I believe as well. So yeah, quite a quite a fair, um, fair way towards the pole there. It's amazing. But Toby, if people, if people want to travel there themselves, what are the obvious kind of routes to take and methods? Well, ob the obvious way to get there, and it is, it's actually pretty accessible. Um, there's a little town there called Longyearbyen, and for the population that's around was around about 2,000 people living there, but it fluctuates wildly with the seasons. So, you know, you'll have a ship turn up that's got a thousand people on it mm. sometimes, maybe 500. Sorry, that's probably a little big, but you have big ships, relatively large vessels turn up. And in the summertime, you know, everybody comes in, in the summer and it, it can get relatively busy. Um, but ac access is not is quite easy from Norway. Um, so flights are out of Tromsø, okay. which is in the north, and out of Oslo, uh, which is obviously the capital. So for a, an Australian audience, um, you know, it's very easy to jump on a flight from Melbourne, uh, stop in the Middle East, and then you'd be in Oslo, and uh, you can sort of get up there the following day, a couple of two and a half hours flight, that sort of thing. So oh, really? yeah. 18, it's a day's travel really from australia now uh, if you're in the u.s it's pretty long day <laughs> it is a long day yeah, 24 hours <laughs> yeah you, you, usually overnight in oslo or norway before you take the leg out to Svalbard. i'd be guessing typically yes typically unless unless the flights you can sort of line it up so that you can arrive and it depends how much you value your sleep i guess yeah. uh, i always take at least a night <laughs> personally um if you're in the u.s uh it's obviously it's quite you hop to europe lots of points to jump into europe depending on where you're departing from uh out of the east coast it's pretty pretty straightforward you, you can't get there directly from greenland or iceland that's that's right no. yeah there's no to my knowledge there's no direct flights it's all with norwegian um uh yeah with the norwegian airline yeah is it um managed by norway as a country like is how is it positioned politically yeah so good question it's um it's a Norwegian territory um, and it's administered by the Sisselman. Uh, the Sisselman is a governor. Um, so he's effectively, he's the, 
the head, he or she is the, the head of the government um, on Svalbard and they're independent, but they come under Norwegian jurisdiction. So they make their, they sort of have their own governance. Uh, they're a territory of Norway as opposed to um, part of the mainland of Norway, but it is, yeah, it's Norwegian territory. Yeah. Toby, do you want to, if you're in, if you want to explore that a little bit further, do you, are you open to jumping on Google Maps and leaning into Svalbard a little bit more? Yeah, uh, sure. Because then we could sort of speak about the, yeah. the accessibility of certain places changes very dramatically through the seasons and the sea ice has a really big impact on where you can and can't travel to depending on the time of year there. Um, same with any kind of um, polar or polar region, really. Uh, just an idea. We don't have to, but um... yeah, no. Well, I'm assuming as well that it's the sort of place that you kind of do need to explore by by the coast as well. Like in terms of, there's no real roads or um, you know exploration by land. Is that is that accurate or pretty much? Yeah, and that's probably is a good moment. Um, I'll jump across to I'll jump across to the. Is it going to let you? Absolutely. Oh, Google Maps. Yeah, excellent question, uh, Luke, about the accessibility of, of land based. You know, I was assuming it was mainly ship ship sort of ex exploration, but I was curious to know the intricacies of, particularly with such a small population, you know, how much of the island themselves have they actually managed to get to spend time. And it's it's unusual, I think, in that it's that it has had no indigenous uh, population at all. So really we're all kind of mod modern visitors to it and it's just had it's it's millions of years to develop and be be left on its own um, well let's assume we're starting in australia because this is where we are maybe even right down in tasmania mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so you're probably going to get yourself to melbourne fly all the way across either through you know thailand or somewhere in it's somewhere crazy. in the middle east yeah. Abu Dhabi, probably. Abu Dhabi. And then we're in Europe. And Svalbard is all the way up up here, right up the very top there. Let's just zoom right in. End of the earth. Mm. You can see, you know. It's really back to like it look a long, long way from here, mate. It is a long way yeah. from here, yeah. And you can see, wow. just, a, just as an interesting aside, like now we're up in the Arctic. We're overlooking the, this is the Arctic oh. Basin. Um, covered by sea ice during the winter predominantly. And you can see that this is the land masses mostly connect all the way across the north here, but not, not here, not here. This is Novoya Zemla. Um, and up here, it does sort of connect to the mainland. So these, are you guys able to see my cursor? Yes. Yep. 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 So just these areas up the top here, uh, this one, sorry, did, this, is, this was inhabited, but these areas were just far too far. You know, tra transportation in the early years by Inuit was by kayak and also umiak, which is a sort of a large skin canoe. Um, and these waters are just, it, it's a great distance. It's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers across the coast. Mm -hmm. So- Probably pretty treacherous, I imagine. And wildly treacherous, treacherous land. So it's sort of not surprising. Cap, that... The ice cap actually goes down as far as Svalbard there, then. Um, yeah, so in the, the extent of yeah, where's the ice cap line roughly? Um, well, the sea ice, you know, um, oh, yeah. which sort of melts, melts and um, freezes in each season. So, in the in the winter time, the extent of the sea ice is is definitely down to, to this sort of level here. But it's not all just a flat pack. It's moving. It's it's because you've got big currents of that are running. It, the sea ice is actually kind of a gyre here that. The sea ice is rotating, so it's it's moving, it's undulating, it's cracking. It's not a it's not a safe passage, I guess. This the ice, but it's kind of a semi-marine environment, um, partly frozen and 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 tumultuous. But in the winter time, yeah, it's right down uh, on the back of of Svalbard here, and then in the summertime, let's go right in. It can melt right the way back up to this sort of area here. And just to be frank, you know, more and more, it's further and further back each each season in the last sort of ten years or so, as as um, as the area warms up. So you know where we're looking at starting. So this is where, well, 
basically everyone who comes here is going to go to Longyearbyen. This is the area here, Longyearbyen. Um, and then traveling this east coast, this section, and this section, and this section, Edgeoya, um, Spitsbergen, Alisund. This, this coastline here is generally very accessible at all times of year, including in the wintertime, although the, the, um, the tops of the fjords will be frozen. It can be frozen solid inside the fjords here, but it's generally open, um, so you can navigate by boat. And as the summer goes on, the sea ice melts further and further back, opening up more and more areas uh, to exploration. So we, uh, for the trip that we're doing, we're going in uh, late May, early June, which is right at the beginning of the season. Um, one of the great advantages of that time of year and the reason that I'm very keen to get there is because of the extent of the sea ice. Um, and that means that there are, there are some areas that we probably won't be able to get to, or you know you might not be able to get through this area here. So the Hinlope and Strait might not be navigable, but the you are you are more likely to see um, polar bears, walrus, Arctic fox living on the ice, um, and that's quite a really really special experience. So just living and travelling across and around the pack ice, uh, something that I find really really exciting and and um, and super interesting, something quite different. Pretty mm -hmm. Donna, where are the main peaks, Toby? When you show the images later that, that have those really sharp peaks you're referring to, where, where are you talking about? So uh, they're all pretty much on this island and scattered all over. Uh, this is... Um, oh, that's consistent with that level of, of height and the rock structures all the way through. Okay. Yeah, and you can sort of see really on, the, on Google Earth here, you know, these deep gullies. Mm -hmm. With, with glaciers you, this is all glaciated amazing place ice cap beautiful mountains all through this area here once you come over to northeast land over here this is an ice cap third largest in the world i think it is um, after greenland and antarctica so this is basically flat covered in covered in snow and ice um, but spitsbergen this island here this is where all the big sort of pointy peaks are and a lot of it's in this area around here and down in these fjord systems here, which is, um, you know. So, so Toby, in, a, in the eight day trip you got planned, what, what's, do you have a specific area or it's very, very weather dependent where you're going to end up going? Um, yeah. What's one of the, yeah, one of the great things about the trip and, you know, exciting things for me is uh, it's very dynamic. It's always about what's, what's on offer, what's, what's good at the time. Like what, what are the best opportunities that we have, you know, with, turn up and be like okay so where's the sea ice how how extensive is it this year which parts uh have got sea ice which don't where have the bears been sighted usually you know you get a bit of inside knowledge about what's happening um, maybe there's a whale carcass or there's a reindeer carcass and so the bears have been feeding in a particular area we all want to we all really want to see polar bears like there's something magic um, and so they tend to be sort of concentrated in particular areas when uh, when there's been a maybe a whale's washed up or something like that, so those things will influence um, where where you plan to go. Um, things like the the wind direction, well, it's you know will influence where the pack is, the currents, the 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 temperature, you know, average temperature over the last months are all going to sort of impact where you might go on any given voyage. But generally speaking, uh, out of Longyearbyen. You're going to explore the fjord systems up to the north um, and down to the south around these islands down here and then possibly up through the, the Hinlope and Strait, depending on um, on the sea ice extent at that time of year. Yeah, and I'm interested in the scale. I can see there down the bottom, it's about 100 k's, um, almost what looks like it's about 300 k's top to bottom or maybe a little bit longer, bit, bit further. Approximately 300 kilometres yeah. from this point to this point yeah so typically you know we move at night so you know you'll you'll do your outings during the day um, and or before breakfast and or after dinner depending on how enthusiastic you are and um, and what opportunities are are there but then we'll usually be sort of on the move during the the sleeping hours 
Yeah, I was going to say but, that. Like in terms of night, it's that, that's not really. It's more sleeping. It, it's there is, so yeah. The we haven't spoken night. about it yet, but the, one of the most significant aspects of any sort of polar exploration is light, and mm. how much or how little there is relative to the time of year. So, so say for example, if you're using that particular May to June trip, what sort of light hours are we talking about, Toby? Twenty-four hours of daylight. Mm. Woo, cooking. Yeah, and so it's hard. It's hard because you have to sleep at some point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I don't know about you, Luke or Paul, but um, I do, and uh, most well, other people do as yeah, well. But, talk but about it's it. <laughs> you, you know you get pretty roped in, and um, there's there's a lot to see, you know. So, and just any time you can you can get up and you can do stuff, you know. And then there's pretty much always someone up watching, looking you know maybe we spot it's possible to spot blue whales like i've seen a blue whale out here it's there's gray whales there's fin whales there's belugas there's uh walrus there's polar bears there's all you know birds in their thousands there's walrus just so many things that that happen you know day and night and so if you want to engage there's always something to see mm. and that that's pretty remarkable with the takes of the light. Though, I'd imagine. Yeah. Well, there's Sorry. probably no, no other opportunity like it in the world in terms of uh, in terms of travel and that level of engagement, length of time, visually, um, because of the amount of light. It blows your mind, and it, I guess that you know, some I find you know, I do have to kind of switch off, give myself a break, um, come back because it can just be so amazing, you know, mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming in some ways. Mm -hmm. The um, you know, this and this place, I guess, is one of the great things about it is it's one of the world's great places to see polar bears you know greenland you probably you know think polar bears but actually they're not as common um, or they're more they're just more spread out than they are here in svalbard so um, that's one of the sort of big big things to see in in svalbard mm. i'm going to stop share and move yeah. back yeah, i was going to say right. it's back. yeah 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 if that works for you guys sure and i just you know i'm not sure where we're at with time you guys can yeah we've got it probably about half an hour or so something like that yeah. right no worries and uh have, have we got my slideshow back up yep. there yeah yep. good thanks um yeah so i just thought maybe we can just whip into a couple of really quick photos from the area itself mm. um yeah walrus Ooh. they often huddle together here and just fart they do <laughs> and, <laughs> i wasn't expecting that <laughs> they just kind of hang out burping and farting and just rolling around on each other so these are all males after is that a part of a uh, animal in terms of animal behavior is that just a certain time of year is it just what they do regularly wherever they land is it part of a mating ritual what's the yeah so it's after after mating um and the 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 males just Island hanging out. They're just hanging out. Yeah, and that's pretty common for seals. Um, not that they're a seal, but yeah, for phocids, they do similar. They do a similar thing. So they're they're just kind of hanging out together, feeding, um, being social. Yeah, the farting is is not anything ritualistic. It's just because of the diet. So they primarily eat mollusks. <laughs> they just eat a lot. They they have the whiskers, and they'll cruise along the sea. The the sea, the sea floor sort of through the mud and wait for the mollusks and then they'll just grab them and they suck the suck the meat out of the shell chuck the shell on they go so that's kind of where they feed they're very cumbersome on land um, they're quite skittish um, you got to move very slowly in towards them um, and there are limitations on the distance you can be from the animal yeah um, what, what are they roughly toby it's about 30 meters but but <laughs> it's more about animal behavior and observation. So when you're with people who are experts in observing and understanding the behavior, then you can sort of slowly move forwards and slowly move forwards. And that helps with the photography, helps with the experience. Um, but it's, you know, you want to make sure you don't sort of scatter the herd. Um, so that's... And, and so Toby, on the boat um, and on most boats, I, I imagine as well, like particularly on your trips, you, you make sure you have people that have that kind of animal behavior knowledge and skill set in terms of absolutely planning and tracking down where they are and educating people around, you know, how, how to be present and uh, aware of the kind of behaviors, which, which makes a big difference photographically, because the, the more you can understand what to expect, the more prepared you can be, because sometimes those moments can be fleeting and, if you're not expecting sudden movements or or you don't get a sense of where they're likely to move to or from, 
um, then you're less likely to get the good shots. Most of the guides, you know, they're people who are polar professionals, so they spend a lot of time in these areas and they they get a good understanding of, of animal behaviour and ha- how they operate. And so, you know, but then we also bring in um, experts who are, you know, marine biologists, uh, marine ecologists, uh, people who study um, animal behaviour and also have decades of experience working in these sorts of areas. So they're very good at informing us of, you know, what, well, first of all, where we might see where we're going to find animals, um, but also how those animals are going to act when we arrive, what sort of cycle they're up to in, in the mating or seasonal movement, um, and then observe, observation of animal behaviour in, in situ. So you can start to see, um, like if a polar bear is getting a bit skittish or aggressive, um, if you see a polar bear, we get off land, of course, yeah. but, yeah. <laughs> um, Out but of the way. particularly... particularly observing um uh walrus you know just being able to sort of see the cues as as they start to um if they get flustered or you know uh sort of had enough of your observation they're expert at sort of spotting those things as well so toby like it, we, we we joked about the the penguins and polar bears between north and south but it's more than it's much more than that is it there's very distinctive difference with wildlife between when polar and the, the arctic and antarctic do you want to speak to that a little bit more like yeah for sure i mean i guess you know the big ticket items yeah the most obvious difference is you know, for the polar regions two really iconic species would be penguins and they're only found in the Southern Hemisphere, with the exception of a few that just sort of sneak across the equator near the Galapagos. But they are pretty much, you know, they're, they're found in the Southern Hemisphere, they're found in the sub-Antarctic islands, and also very much um, on the Antarctic continent or the periphery of the Antarctic continent. And um, in the north, um, and in the north is the polar bear, that's the kind of most iconic uh, animal that you'd see um, or that you'd that uh, you probably know about um, and then I guess in the north and the south you know you do have a, there are actually quite a few similarities though as well like so you've got seals um, that are you know they they occupy a certain area in the ecosystem so in the food chain um, they've got a lot of different types of seals both in the north and the south uh, walrus would only be found in the north um and then whales are traveling backwards and forwards you know between the two poles so you will find similar whale species uh orcas humpbacks um you'll find them both in the north and in the south and then they travel you know to the equator and then back um as well as uh, blue whales which are global um with limited knowledge of their complete distribution certain birds um, like the Arctic tern will move from one end to the other. Um, even birds that we have here in, in uh, Tasmania, the short-tailed shearwater or mutton bird, they will also travel from, from the south to the north. So there's sort of, I guess there's, you know, there's, there's big differences and there's also similarities, you know, in, in, in the types of wildlife that you might expect to see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Keep cruising along. I want to see the more pickies. <laughs> all right. Well, to the most exciting of them all, of course, the polar bear. You know, we, we sort of got to get to talk a bit more about, <laughs> about bears. I've got this first shot on the left here, which is that was the first polar bear that I ever saw. And um, we were cruising around in Svalbard um, just we were actually, it was actually lunchtime. And so the guys were cooking up a feast and we'd come up to some sea ice and everyone's up on the bridge, just sort of got the binoculars looking out. What have we got? What's, what's going on out here? And then in the distance, oh, look, there, there's, a, there's a bear. And you could see him just lifting his nose. And uh, we worked out that obviously the guys were cooking up a big curry and he just uh. must have sniffed it out <laughs> and was coming up. So anyway, he came right up to the edge here and just sort of stood there on the edge and was looking out at us just sniffing and sniffing and just hung out and just you know was very comfortable just being there in that position but um you know polar bears are uh, they're a marine animal so they're actually you know living on the sea ice and in the water Mm. 
and that's their main habitat. So when they stop on land in the summertime, when the sea ice retreats, it's not really their preferred area. They're, they're, and, they're, and actually they're starting to get hungry. They, and they're, they're kind of scavenging at that point rather than hunting. So they're a very exciting animal to see um, and particularly on the sea ice. And I'm assuming too, seeing them on the sea ice is just a rapidly diminishing sort of occurrence as well. It, it is harder, you know, as the sea ice retreats further and further. Um, obviously, there's, you know, at this point, there's still, there's still a good amount of sea ice. Um, but yeah, that is sort of one of the reasons that I was so keen on the early part of the year was mm. just because of that, you know, guaranteed yeah. ice and the extent yeah. of it and that sort of thing. But yeah, so they do play a major role and they, for them, they impact our our experience on shore because we have to be we're under guard basically at all times so it, the guides will, will be carrying rifles um and we're always on the lookout and we're very selective about the places that we land so you end up spending a lot of time in the zodiacs because it's safe it's a great place to view things from a safe distance and then we'll be making landings uh, at certain areas but always uh, under the direction or guidance and observation of, of some of those local guides and experts. Yeah. And they, um, they swim at around about, I don't know, eight or so kilometers per hour, which is approximately the same speed as a, a kayak on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I have had, <laughs> I have had them follow me, you know, uh, wow. once or twice. And um, yeah, that's quite exciting. We saw one, you know, I was like, come on, guys, let's go have a look. You know, he's just cruising around. He's having a look and he's happy and sort of comes down and he's on the top of the hill. And I'm like, all right, I, you know, he's still fine. He's just kind of curious, you know, but maybe maybe let's put the cameras away and just, you know, kind of get yourself ready. And then he comes a little bit further down and it's like, he'll probably just stop here on the edge of the water, you know, just, just having a look. He's just curious, but um, maybe we'll just point our boats that way and, you know, we'll get ready and, and then he's just like straight into the water, straight towards us. I'm like, okay, let's paddle. <laughs> and then I get on the radio and like, uh, I think we're going to need a pickup. Yep. <laughs> put, a, put a boat in the water, please. And um, yeah, so there, you know, but he was just crossing. We just happened to be in his way. He was just heading over to a, um, heading over to a whale carcass. So, but they are, you know, they're around and they are, a potentially dangerous animal um but you know very majestic and, and beautiful to watch and you know something really special mm. Mm. just moving across there we go so i guess you know one of the things we've talked a little bit about it's just ice you know ice is nice there it just breeds so much beauty it it it's um it's always different, always changing, you know, you, from the smallest little piece to the largest piece. We saw some of those large tabular icebergs from Antarctica. Now Svalbard is obviously dominated by sea ice, so very low and gentle. Um, and then uh, a lot of glacial ice. So this one on the right-hand side here is the underside of a glacier, which has been hanging out over the water. And the marine, uh, the, the ocean, ocean is freezing onto the bottom. And so it creates this kind of interesting greenish color or bluish color, but yeah. And then of course that coupled with the light, mm. which is always so varied and the fog and the often, you often get good sort of mist or, you know, broken light um, and fog during the summertime up there. So just even in the middle of the day, it's actually kind of an advantage. I, mm. I find I just from a photographic perspective, but also just from a, the, you know, an enjoyment of the area, having that sort of mistiness and uh, mystery about the place is actually really quite nice to me. It adds adds a kind of a dimension to it as well. Wow. But I talked just about you know Spitsbergen, the pointed pointed mountains, mm. and I think you know who hasn't been through a black and white phase, but you know, <laughs> <it's better. laughs> you know the just the ice and the that simple simple contrast in the landscape is something that really kind of brings it all alive for me and and um yeah there's just a few shots from from spitzbergen just uh glaciers mm. mountains and, uh, so if we if we're thinking about i mean i was already visualizing if i'm in a if i'm in a zodiac depending on what we're going to photograph 
what lens do I want on the end of my camera? And what do I make sure I bring on a trip like this? I mean, and we haven't spoken to that, but it's worth speaking to, I think. Like, obviously, from a wildlife perspective, having an extra telephoto length is really significant and useful. Um, and it probably wouldn't hurt to have some, some sort of stabilization either in the body or in the lens, I imagine, because if you're shooting from a zodiac, you're not necessarily going to have um, opportunity to, do, to get out of tripod to do certain shooting. So having something you're quite comfortable shooting with by hand most of the time, I'd say would be, and also from the deck of the front of the boat would be an advantage. Do you, what's what have you seen people do, Toby? And what, what in your experience would you sort of suggest as a as a rough kind of uh, focal length variation to make sure you bring on a trip like this? You know, it's it's very personal question in some ways, but it's it's worth it's worth exploring. Yeah, it's going to be obviously you know. Um guided a little bit by personal style but yeah for and also what your focus is but for you know for wildlife the longer the better i mean you just you know <laughs> you you almost sort of can't get close enough i guess we get quite close um with the zodiacs um but you're still going to want a pretty long lens um and if wildlife is your focus you know get something you really really want to work with paul some um, suggestion on on a bit of stabilization is really good the the zodiacs do sort of move a little bit so um, you're going to have to have uh, something that's adding a bit of stabilization for you um yeah, i would have thought yeah. like they made like a 100 to 400 to be a pretty ideal lens to have mm. um in terms of still being able to be operate handheld because mm. uh, once you start getting bigger than that it's it's pretty hard to operate by hand mm. uh, in terms of movement um unless you've got a certain yeah, skill set uh, what were you thinking, Loki? Like you, you've shot a bit in some of the polar areas. Oh too. yeah, I mean, yeah, and photographing up a boat um, can have its challenges for sure. Um, and um, I think you know, like, I think it, I agree with pretty much everything you've said there. Um, you know, some these days that the like Sony has a two hundred to six hundred, which is still relatively uh, compact for for what it can do. Um, gotcha. So that there's those sort of uh, lenses available that have really good image stabilization. Um, so yeah, that's definitely what you'd be after. I'm assuming on the expedition ship itself, you you know, it's a lot more stable, and so you can. Hmm. I don't know if it'd be tripod level or anything like that, but um, definitely maybe mono, um, monopod, maybe. But yeah, no, but, just sorry, just to jump in on that. Yeah, no, like uh, having um, tripods is great. It's, it's there's nothing wrong with using a tripod on on the ship, um, and a lot of the time when we're cruising in the fjords, you can see a bit of water in these shots. It's quite flat, and that is true you know most of the time it's really quite calm in those fjords and okay. the boat just cruises along and um the front of the ship you've got really, really great cool. areas to set up tripods and also on the top deck and the sides and yeah and i've, I've set up tripods out there but just okay. also you've got the, the long lens but don't forget about something wide because when mm. you're getting nice and close to a piece of ice um i find you know that's one way to really bring that alive mm. So it's, it's it's a hard question because everything is what you want and all of them. Yeah. <laughs> of course, <but> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something really long is going to be super important. Um, these are all kind of mid range. So it's, uh, but it is, yeah, it's a bit of personal style. I should probably let you guys talk more about that. That's really oh, more, more your expertise. Right. Like, like I'd be, I'd be like my first combo would be maybe like 24, 105 and then 100, 400. Mm, and that would immediately cover probably at least from a focal length point of view, maybe 90% of the kind of features you're going to come across. I would um, totally agree with you, Paul. I think that's really, yeah. And, and yeah. I, like, I was wondering as well, Toby, like um, what people can take also is um, dependent on, you know, a, you know, getting it there on, on aircraft and things. And then also, you know, luggage allowances and, also, you know, what kind of uh, bag you can take on a Zodiac, for example. Um, do you have mm. any sort of thought process there in terms of what, you know, the limits may be? You know, could, would, it, would it be practical to take two bodies, for example, and, and those kind of aspects? Yeah, I guess the, yeah, we did talk a little bit about this earlier and it just sort of got me thinking a bit. And, you know, having things in a Pelly case gives you the most... Um, uh, Protection. security from a from a water perspective you're mm. always going to be around water and uh, it's really important to remember that and just be prepared for the reality that it's a marine environment and um, you've got to be a bit careful um but and also in those zodiacs it is hard it's not always possible to have uh, like mountains of gear because you've got to move from one side of the, the zodiac to the other um just to be able to um 
you know, view the wildlife and or get in or out of the zodiac. And sometimes it's a bit rocky. So a bit selective depending on the, on the, um, on the area you're going to, but you know, a lot of the time, what we'll do is we'll actually just, if you're taking two bodies, for example, you know, slot one inside your jacket, you know, just have it zipped up inside your jacket um, and the other one around your neck and, you know, cradle it as you go, like put it, put it, put it behind your jacket as you're cruising along. You don't yeah. really get too wet a lot of the time. Like you can get splashed if it gets really windy, but that, that is a, is not a bad way. Just like, um, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be doing that personally. That's probably, that's exactly how I'd approach it um, for two reasons. One is you're, you're not going to have any capacity to change lenses in the middle of a zodiac environment with people around you and wildlife. And, and also the accessibility of being able to switch from a, from a wider, you know, where you, from a wildlife shot to a, to a close up um, ice piece might happen in the same zodiac trip. So, mm. so having one sort of ready to go and you're wearing so many layers anyway, and it's not necessarily going to get in other people's way if you've got it tucked inside your jacket and, uh, you know, you're, you're keeping it kind of out of the elements, depending on which one you got in there. So that's where the focal length of like 100 to 400 is quite um, portable in terms mm. of you could actually have it under your armpit and keep it out of the way or even potentially stuck it down your jacket and swap from one to the other. Um but I'm I'm a bit gamer the most, so so I would be leading that way. And <laughs> the time and the bulk of having the the pelly case, if you've got you know ten people on a boat, is is a, probably a, a slight issue. So I'd I'd pro probably go the light gorilla style a little bit myself, and and take the risk and just try and be careful. But I think it also certainly pay to make sure that your um camera insurance, insurance. covers um those kind of events. Yeah, as I was well. going to say. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the only other thing to think about is you know like um it's a dynamic environment so moving between the ship and the and the zodiac um you need your hands so you're going to need to be able to grab onto somebody or something um so and sometimes what we've done is you know if it's a particular special shirt or something and you really need to bring a bit of extra equipment you might load that in the in the zodiac before it goes over the side of the ship and then you come down hands free and you've, you've still got your gear there so Sure. Because it is a bit from a strap point of view, I, I tend to lean towards more longer over the shoulder kind of straps. So if I need a, if I've got two really short and I'm trying to do two bodies, it can mm. get pretty awkward. They get wrap, wrapped up in each other. And also when you're walking along the ice, it's very easy to slip it over one shoulder. And then you've got two hands free if need be, if you're worried about slipping over or just need some extra traction or um, getting in and out of the boat. Um, and then you can often shorten those straps down if it's more useful um, as well. The pick designs ones are quite good for that, aren't they? You can sort of slide yep. them along and, and adjust them quite easily. You can clip clip the straps on and off very easily as well, which can yes. be quite useful. Yes, with those anchors, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, that's some really good, good um, uh, you know, insights, I suppose, in terms of what's involved um, shooting in those sort of areas and maybe some considerations that people hadn't had uh, in terms of the specifics of all of that, but there's always logistic um, realities and, and compromises that you need to make uh, in order to to be you know have have a, you can't have it all in most things in photography and, yeah. and you know there's there's yeah. going to be some level of compromise there. But um, just yeah, need a fourteen to four hundred two point eight. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, just need the elusive fourteen to four hundred two point eight lens. <laughs> I think um, yeah. someone just announced a 50 to 400, I think. Um, oh, really? I think it was Tamron or, or someone, yeah, just announced that. So I don't know the quality of it, but, um, yeah, they are they are getting more and more um, better ranges and better quality for, over those ranges as well. Like the quality you can get even just from a 100 to 400 is pretty remarkable across the whole range. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely um, making it easier for people these days. Might be time for an upgrade. <laughs> that's right. it's, it is kind of, i mean if you're going to invest that in a trip like i mean that's the beauty of two things one it probably is potentially a good time to either borrow or or, uh, or hire or um or invest in maybe something significant to really get the most because you're investing quite a lot of money on a trip like this it's, that's just how it is mm -hmm. and then you'll have people like you know uh, myself and luke and toby and all the kind of experience we have to lean into to make sure you really do optimize every one of those moments. Like if you've got a new system and you're not really sure how to use it, which is not uncommon for that very reason, like, oh, oh, I'm going this incredible trip. I, you know, I've, I've already invested in the trip, but I want to get great shots. So I'm going to get this new system. And you may not have that much time to figure out all the P's and Q's or, 
or the menu system on a Sony. God bless you all. Uh, <laughs> you've got now. Now. <laughs> people like us to uh, to lean in and make sure you're just really getting the most of every single moment. And we're helping you prepare for the kind of focal lengths to depending on what we're what a subject matter we're approaching on the day what to have accessible at the time. We'll be able to do slideshows and image critiques in the evenings to really refine kind of our approaches day by day and really lean into the strengths, you know, making sure you're using the right shutter speeds and and handling, so just getting the most of the equipment you've got and and also leaning into the the knowledge and experience of, of the polar guides in terms of preempting, you know, each day kind of what highlights are potentially going to be coming our way, which wildlife to be prepared to capture and preparing yourself with both the equipment choices and the, and the settings that you use each day to, to really get the most of it. Mm, definitely. So Toby, we should we keep whipping through the show because we, we're pushing up onto our, to our shortly. We've got a bit more we definitely want to show through. So Fabulous. Yeah. I'll wander on. I guess the other, you know, that, sort of landscape highlights but for me a big part of the the experience is the people you know people in landscapes and that's probably where I've ended up focusing my my photographic f focus <laughs> um, for want of a better word it's always been around you know what are the people doing and and um, that mostly for me has been photography and uh, kayaking but um, I was very careful not to just do kayaking shots I've have to keep being reminded uh, there's more to life than kayaking but uh, <laughs> um, I won't go on to too many stories with that one but um, I talked a little bit about the different types of ships that people operate on you know from a large cruise ship you know the cruise ships can be up to 10,000 people they're huge wow. um, and a lot of the cruise vessels now there's quite a few new ones coming into the market which are more like 150 sort of people or so um, and the one that I have worked with a lot in the past and the one that I'm chartering is uh, 50 passengers so it's an older vessel I like to say it's an ex-Russian spy ship uh, owned by the uh, a rough Russian oligarch or it was um, basically they were used there was a, a group of these ships built in 1983 in Finland they were used uh, extensively for oceanographic research and observation so yes, they were definitely feeding information back to the Soviet Union about other vessels and what they're up to. And then at the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, a few sort of well-connected individuals just ended up with them in their hands. Um, and that this particular vessel was then chartered by a fellow called Greg Mortimer, um, who was Australia's one of the in the first party of Australians to summit Mount Everest, and um, a great guy and um, an explorer. And I worked under another guy called Al Baker, who um, set up the sea kayaking in Antarctica. He was the first person to sort of offer that as a commercial experience. Um, and that was the business that I have been working for and now own. And um, this was the vessel that we used a lot of the time. Um, 50 passengers. Um, and you can see the sort of older style vessel. And one of the things I love about it, and, you know, just from a photographic perspective, I, the deck is amazing. To sure. Share this is the, the 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 front deck. Not many vessels are built this way. Um, with that, big big closed deck. decks, aren't they, Toby? A lot of well, the new style um, is more efficient in the water, um, but they're closed off at the front, so it's maybe some small windows um, and small balconies on the sides. But this has three hundred and sixty. You've got the top, you've got the front deck, you've got all the sides, and you've got the back, and they're all great areas for. Wow shooting from you know so from so the front just imagine right the amazing shots that they'd be getting just even with that scene in that picture if you're the oh, yeah. person's just in the front of the boat there what a, what an amazing channel there to with the with the mountains in the back and, yeah. I, and i guess types that there's different experiences in terms of the the size and volume of the boats that you alluded to like um the flexibility of where they can go really changes and the larger boats as much as they have maybe greater creature comforts are, are far less flexible about how close they can get to and how far they can reach into some of the fjords and and i guess when you've got a smaller more intimate boat like this it's it's there's more flexibility and choice around like where we go and why also from a daily point of view in terms of the responding to the dynamism of the environment around you Absolutely, and, yeah. and it's quite unique from a photographic perspective and, and just how accessible all parts of the boats are which which is not always the case on, on a lot of the polar boats yeah so as you're alluding to paul you know 50 people um usually i'll go just flick across to the next image just 
I'll come back to what you're saying and just want to re really reiterate some of those points because it is really important. The boat itself has just been refurbished. So um, it used to have some big plumbing issues, you know, you couldn't flush the toilet, that kind of thing. And all of those things have been fixed, which is lovely, um, but they haven't overdone it. So it's quite nice. It's what simple uh, Scandinavian style. It's mostly bunks. There's a few kind of double beds for couples in, in some of the, the, the cap, the, um, bigger cabins, you got a great sort of lecture area and there's a second sort of lecture area, which um, often the photographers will use as a sort of place to share photos and review and, and, and do those sorts of things. One of the unique things about the this vessel is the bridge is open. So you can go in and talk to the captain, watch them. Oh, work. really? You yeah. can hang out. You've got this view out here where you're looking out. And, and this is where a lot of people spend time, you know, with the binoculars, looking out for bears, looking out for walrus reindeer just seeing what's what's happening um out there you know just watching the world go by and it's a lovely sort of social hub um and then obviously you've got a bar and kitchen and all those things and a sauna just to unwind but <laughs> really i wanted to talk a little bit more about um how a day sort of typically works um and what sort of what activities uh sort of happen on the vessel uh, or from the vessel so we've got on this vessel um only 50 50 passengers we've got five zodiacs each one takes up to 10 people um you've got a kayak group which usually has around 12 or 14 people um you might have a in antarctica is not so applicable to svalbard but um in antarctica we have a skiing group um and then mm. we and then obviously photographic groups so and then like cross-country skiing obviously yeah, backcountry skiing, yeah. 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 So that really, what it does, you know, it really breaks it up. So if you think about 130 people all going out cruising and everybody's in a Zodiac, it means that all those Zodiacs are full and it just takes time to get everyone in there. Yeah. If you've got a kayaking group that's disappeared, you know, I'll take my mob and off I go, then you've left with sort of 40-odd 40, 40 people or less um, and still got five Zodiacs so you can you can customize the experience a bit more. You can have a smaller number of people in each Zodiac. So you might sort of go, Hey, Luke, you want to take that one and pull that one and off you go and do something different, or you are all together in one, depending on the size of the group, the different, you know, so you've got these sort of add on activities with skiing. That's an add on, you know, you pay. <laughs> <laughs> that's free. You can do that one for free. <laughs> the, the, um, the kayaking is a sort of additional program. It's a supplement that, that people pay and the same with the with the um with the photo photography you know it's an add-on uh the guys come on and obviously add to your experience and um but on, on this trip it's it's kind of one or the other toby because obviously it, it's it's a whole different process and approach and and planning and logistics and and even potentially even um, areas that we're focusing on so mm. on this one you, you either kind of do one or the other you can't exactly. at least switch from one to the other so just so you know yes yeah. also you know we were just talking about the complexities of, of shooting from a kayak so it's probably pretty understandable as well a lot, to... lot more risks involved i do uh, love that we sort of jumped straight into you know how to shoot from a kayak i could do probably a whole series on <laughs> yeah Two days of talking, but anyway, yeah. And so, with the you've got these add-on activities that usually like a group, a smaller group will engage with and and get specialist support and and um, to enhance the experience. Um, and then, generally speaking, we've got what's called general cruising. So, you will get into the zodiac and cruise around. And for the photographers, that means you'll be cruising around looking for photographic opportunities and focusing in on that. Um, and then we've got shore landings. Um, which is where we're going to take everyone ashore and there's a particular point of interest you know maybe it's one of the old whale stations or uh, there's a just you know great landscape or a short walk there that's really really special um, and so those are the sort of main things that we're doing general cruising and shore landings in between you know time on board lectures or photo review and technical support um, and then meals, you know, and you've got meals, you've got a breakfast time, you've got a lunch time and a dinner time. Most sort of cruise vessels will be set up, you know, okay, so you have breakfast and then after breakfast you go out and then you have lunch. After lunch, you you go out. So it's sort of two, two to four hour stints, isn't it, Toby, roughly? Yeah, between those, between sort of breakfast, end of breakfast and the beginning of lunch, you've got two to four hours that you're outside doing something. Maybe you move with the ship a little bit and they do what ship cruising um you know from going from one place to another but 
with such a small vessel and such a high number of staff on board, we're able to also sort of be like, oh, you know what? Pre-breakfast is going to be the go. Like, let's get out and do something before breakfast. Or, hey, we just spotted a pot of whales. We got to go and have a look at this. Let's just pause on lunch. We can wait another hour and let's go do that. Mm. Just something that you, and that's why I wanted to work you, with. You can't do on the bigger boats. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just not yeah. possible on the bigger boat because the hospitality staff say no. <laughs> I mean, it that, yeah, we do have to have some regularity, but it does provide a great deal of flexibility um, having such a, a smaller vessel and um, having an intimate experience. And it just means, it, it also means you, it's kind of just the right amount of people that you can get to know everyone on board. Mm, and um, that's, that's something really, really special about that, that sh the ship. And just in terms of the actual kind of physicality of things, you know, I'll just go back. Probably the, one of the harder things in this experience is walking down this um, gangway here. So you've got to sort of reverse or walk down that little gangway there. It can be a little bit slippery. So you, that's where you need your hands uh, to get into the Zodiac and then getting from the Zodiac onto the shore you know, so swinging your legs across the zodiac and onto the shore and walking across uneven ground. Um, those are the those are the only two hard things. So, or hard, or they're the only two sort of barriers, I guess, to um, to so getting on board. Good for mobility, then, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. For, and and we've even, you know, if we had someone who maybe had a little less mobility or the the conditions were a bit rough, we might say, well, why don't you go down the back and you get a ride on the crane. And so, you know, <laughs> get in where it's, we've done that. Someone had a small injury on their leg or, and so it just made their day, made, made getting up and down the gangway a bit more difficult, but we, we overcame it that way, or it was a bit rough. So we're sort of very focused on uh, making it accessible to as wide a range of individuals as possible. Um, and we sort of, we generally will tailor the on land experience, you know, there'll be sort of an ambling group, people who want to focus more on, the details and and be closer in on the landscape and others who really want to sort of stride out a bit more um, and so sort of spread the spread the group uh, experience and opportunities that way so really you know there's it's just really about being adventurous being flexible being open there's very sort of few barriers i guess from a physical perspective or an experience perspective you get everything provided and you support it all the way through and you know we've had people as young as eight and as old as 92 so it yeah. doesn't really seem to have a, a a barrier in terms of age at all um these are really just sort of details about what you'd what you kind of expect really i think I, I feel like i've probably been through that already and you know if people are really interested we can always provide more information on that unless you guys want me to go through things oh no i think um, they can find that out for themselves yeah, so yeah it's, it's pretty, pretty yeah, it's yeah. All fairly self-explanatory and just you know wanted to reiterate you know we've got um people you know i've been working in the industry for i think you know 10 years pretty consistently and another five years before that so you know 15 years of going out to the polar regions the boat we're working with people who have decades of this kind of experience of, of there's a sort of core group of individuals who um, manage the manage the experience on board, drive the zodiacs, um, and uh, know the wildlife in the areas incredibly well, um, and the kayaking, which is my thing, um, and then of course the destination, the experts in photography, Paul and Luke, and that sort of combination is really um, something incredibly special, and I, I just can't reiterate enough how kind of experienced the team is that that we've we've put together and that. Um, is looking to go out there and have a great time. Mm. It's a bit of a Peter Eastway doppelganger there in the bottom. I was going to say, it looks like Peter <laughs> to me. That is Peter Eastway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter, Peter's done quite a lot of time north and south and south Georgia and, and all sorts. He's, he's definitely an experienced polar explorer, Peter. Yeah. Just so, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions about anything far away, as the guys know, I've got hundreds more images. <laughs> <laughs> we probably don't have time to go through but um, well because we're not because we're not live we, we don't necessarily have people from the audience that can reach in right now um and ask us specifically but um i think one of the questions we, we talked about what you know and people can lean into what's provided but at the same time it is worth being 
considerate about well, what gear do you need for your own personal management? You know, what's the kind of minimum rough kind of things that you want to have on board to manage those such extreme temperatures and, and mm, the marine loading. environment as well? Mm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to be honest, people see it as incredibly extreme and it is, but in the summertime, it's not really as, as extreme as you might expect. Uh, definitely does get very cold. So lots of layers is very important. Um, we've always got the opportunity to retreat to the ship. So that is a bit of a safeguard for us. Um, often it's a bit like being in the snow fields. So if you're, if you're not active um, it's, and if it's overcast or windy, then yeah, it gets pretty cold. So base layers like thermals, thermal, thermal tops, thermal bottoms. Merino. Of, merino, wool is definitely best, better than polypropylene. Uh, thick socks, usually a thin pair and a thick pair polypropylene pants you know like a pile pant um, and then a polypropylene top uh, plus probably another polypropylene top or vest and then you've got your shell your outer layer so your waterproof pants your waterproof jacket so raincoat um, i would think like a down vest might be a good investment yeah but downies can be can be good but obviously because you're cruising around on the water um, i usually find polypropylene is probably a better choice yeah. Um, but for being on board the vessel and just moving around on board the ship, then down vest is great. It's really, really warm, really comfortable. Yeah, I'll just reiterate that. Like down, down is susceptible to getting wet and, and it can change its capacity to hold warmth. But like I have one that's, you know, has a waxy kind of seal and I wouldn't wear it unless it was underneath a, a sealed mm, um, wear it under um, raincoat shell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> shell. So yeah. it has it maybe as a roll as a layer and certainly on board it probably one of the more comfortable things to have. Definitely, yeah. I, I sometimes will wear like a um, a down vest, so I have like a polypropylene, you know, full length uh, top undergarment, mid weight, you know, two hundred weight fleece, um, and then I might have a vest on top underneath my um, waterproofs. But I, 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 I use sorry, over trousers. Yeah, so um, over trousers you, with bib and brace can be fantastic, you know, <laughs> something gotcha. hot, but. And then gum boots. So everyone gets gum boots, which are provided. They're on board. So you can you can bring your own if you've got a special pair you love. Um, but because you're adding lots of socks in there for warmth, you you might end up with a sort of size bigger than you would normally use. So there's gum boots provided, and we use those just because when you're coming onto the shore and landing on shore, you know you can't bring the boat right up onto the mm. land. So you're going to have to step in a few inches or a few I'm centimeters. I'm a big water. gum boot fan. That's and then sure. gloves. I don't know yeah. if I could fly mine uh, you know across the world like that <laughs> might have to yeah. leave some camera gear behind but yeah yeah so that's right yeah included. it's <laughs> yeah another weight thing that you don't gloves, have to gloves would be significant would you have multi-layers like liner and an outer, outer glove yeah so and then particularly for photography it's great to have gloves that have uh the fingerless with like a hood a the cap that goes over the top mm. or some light gloves and then some thick gloves because you need that mobility to sort of move around but when you're moving you know, when you're on the Zodiac and cruising and it's there's ice everywhere and it's windy, you need to be able to cover your hands because they do get very cold very quickly. And of I course, also... beanies, balaclavas, you know, and I personally carry more than one beanie. I'll have like a nice lightweight beanie and then I'll have a thick beanie as well, as well as a sun hat, or I might have a sun hat that's insulated. Um, you can get quite quite cool um, design and things like Icebreaker has like a like a neck piece which can warm <laughs> this area and you can pull it up and actually use it as an underlay or even as a as a beanie as well or like a buff. Mm. Um, but yeah, that accessibility with your with your hands and fingers. There, there are quite a lot of gloves that now on the market that have specialized pads around the fingers that you can even still do touch screen operation with. Mm, yeah, um, the capacitive tips um, is a really that's what I really enjoy. North Face do a really good glove with a capacitive tip and they're more like a liner so you can still put a, a yeah i suppose it's, it's, they're, they're not they're not hard to find because yeah. uh, there won't be too many shops to to go fill up on specialist gear um but it's not it's not crazy and over the top and at the same time you know you, you can really pick and choose and manage your own relationship with the environment relative to the choices you make around what trips you go on and knowing how long they're roughly going to be and you know, choose, pick and pick and choose your adventure to some extent as as, as each day um, approaches. We do just one last thing on the equipment. It's really important to remember sun protection. Mm. So, and a really good pair of glasses. It's twenty four hours of daylight, so it could be yeah. sunny all the time. So, protecting your eyes. You know, you get a lot of ice um, reflection off the ice. 
um, and also good sunscreens. And uh, that's where the buff that Paul's talking about around your neck can be really great because you can sort of raise it up over your face and it can mm. protect you from the sun as well. Um, so even when it's cold. You Would you go as far as uh, balaclava? I've got a light balaclava I sort of take everywhere, which I think. Yeah, like they can be brilliant. They, but it's really that I find that's your personal choice. But yeah, balaclavas can be great. Um, yeah, I just have a thin one for when it just gets gnarly. I use it more for skiing and that kind of thing. If the wind gets up, get up really high, and I still, you know, if you want to be out on the deck for a longer period of time and it's super windy and something else, it's, that might be a nice thing to have in your kit. Definitely. And, you know, an interesting, another one that's actually can be quite good is um, ski goggles. Oh, yeah. We wear a lot of, we often wear ski goggles um, when it, when the snow kicks in, you know, because you've just got great, better visibility than glasses and they stay on. But, they're a bit of they're sort of a bit of a luxury because you don't always need them. The other thing that's really important is water, just a water bottle, um, and then uh, binoculars are brilliant. There's obviously there's always going to be binoculars on the ship, and the guides have them. But if you have a great pair, um, they can be great for wildlife spotting. But you can use your six hundred too if you've got that. Mm. Yeah, and <laughs> just go straight uh, to shooting. Have yet. I've eyed up a few six hundreds, but uh, <laughs> don't play with them. They're getting a bit heavy. Um, yeah, I can borrow Josh Hoko's kit sometime. I'd be, I'd be fine. Oh, there goes my battery. Oh, there's the um. That's almost like a. Um, it's a sign. A, a, a cue, isn't it? Whenever your battery is about the two hour mark, and um, <laughs> um, I think it probably is a good natural time to to. What um, should we just? Treat ourselves to just a five minute slideshow of what try be prepared and then sign off just to give oh, yeah. like okay, a bit yeah, of let's like, <laughs> you can work right. this quite quickly. Because you got into the trouble, Toby. It's no trouble. So yeah, Toby has a, a series of images from from a lot of the polar areas of the world, just to just to broaden and just maybe finish the show on a on a bit of a bit more of a visual note. So, and then we'll we'll lean into if you are interested in in going with Toby on any sort of adventure, then uh, his website Southern Southern Sea Ventures is is the place to go to. Uh, I almost uh, have gone to Fiji a few times with Toby. I'm still 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 keen, brother, for when that lines up. It is coming. Okay. Sorry, guys. Just give me one. And Luke, Luke and I will, will will put a landing page together, uh, or we'll have a landing page together for for this particular trip. Yeah, so there'll be, the, there'll, um, be there'll be two avenues. Description um, below, so feel free to check it out. And uh, date wise, it's twenty eighth of May to the sixth of June, two thousand twenty three. Can't wait already. Yeah. I just yeah. I hope that um, what we've talked about gives you a bit of everyone a bit of an insight just into you know, in, into what it's like in the polar regions and how these things operate as, as much as anything. And um, just, yeah, thanks both to both you guys for having me on the show. And, um, you know, well, I think we've got a photographer and photo photographic expert for a little while. <laughs> I think we're done with set out to do, if anybody's ever considering doing a polar trip anywhere, anytime, anywhere with anyone, this, this would be a good episode just to, just to lean into and just sink into visualizing the experience, being present to how you want to pack and travel, what life's going to be like. And so you can just feel a lot more empowered and, and ready to do stuff like this. Oh yeah. Can you guys see the see the images are up and running? Yeah, yeah what's the yeah. All good. Lovely. So just Great. you know, obviously my kind of my background is obviously all in the kayaking, and it just ends up being these opportunities to take photos. This is all Antarctica. Um, this is us pretending to be explorers crossing the sea ice. Um <laughs> oh, it's just that. some you know oh, ridiculous icebergs that have sort of broken up over time and created these incredible archways arch oh my god yeah yeah i don't know if i need to talk about <laughs> the city <laughs> i know what you mean oh yeah. the scale oh, just no. the scale the simplicity the light the kind of interactions with wildlife and you can see everyone in the zodiac there um right next to the to the whales there the whale of the time oh uh, sure oh, nice one lucky lucky which <laughs> kind of that which kind is of that one uh, gen, there was a Gen 2 penguin. Gen 2, that's what I thought, yeah. yeah Antarctica. So big, there's a big tabular iceberg. So. Oh, wow. That's us just out in the front of the little ship there. Oh, so simple and bold. Go back, Toby, that's just, oh. I've seen that one. We've done that one already, but, you know, I love it. So we'll do it again. And then just a couple more.
Yeah, you, you get you don't you don't have to th- put it on speed speed mode, but um, it's just it's a really lovely way to to finish a show, though. I reckon. Oh my, wow, jeez. This is another one. Kayaking Greenland, Greenland, Greenland now, just across from Svalbard. Just across from Svalbard. This is in Scoresby, and this is late in the season, so in September. Um, early September when we do end up having some darkness up there. <laughs> so yeah, a lot less the, light. Um, I can see the stars trailing there. So it's quite a long exposure as well. Like for it to be so sharp, obviously the ship was on the ship. Up, so. Wow. Yeah. 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 I just, yeah, I put a tripod up on the deck there and just went for it. Yes. Traditional Greenlandic dress um, in a place called it took a tumult up in Scoresby Sund. This is the, the, the fall. <laughs> The tundra turning colour. Oh, well, literally the ground-based tundra turns colour. Wow. Yeah, it's this is the forest. This is you know hundreds of years old. The forest. It's oh. really something. Jeez. This is a a fjord system near on the east coast of Greenland, where there's some um, hot springs. I was going to say, is it thermal? Yeah. Yeah, and just the light just happened to be the way it was. You know. Oh my god, the scale! Wow. That's what we talked about earlier about the splash of colour from the kayaks and the shots can be quite spectacular. Mm. Jeez, those ice scales. Just everything so simple, I guess, is the the thing that I really love about it. So finding those. That'd be one of my favourites, that last shot. That's spectacular, Toby. Oof. Svalbard. Just a few shots from Svalbard. I've got still got some work to do here. So looking that, forward um, to getting your tips, guys. That blue there <laughs> is just the most remarkable. Oh, I, I don't, yeah, and the shape of the structures on the ice mm. too. And and look at I can imagine going close yeah, up to that. The close lens, yeah. Almost like the algae like blob sort of shapes down the bottom. And then if you look in detail at that central upper kind of area of it, you can imagine just getting in close there and just oh my goodness. Yeah. It's so, almost like glass. It is. That last you're, one, saying, that you're saying, Toby, it can be it, the misty kind of moody um, thing is, is is quite common, isn't it? It's common it, through summer, all through the summertime. So from yeah. May through, you know, uh, September, it's yeah, relatively common. Which to oh, me, is, so much to me is an advantage. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, blue skies, to be honest, they, they don't necessarily produce the most. They're good for cookie cutter postcard shots, but they're less dramatic and. Um, kind of emotional sometimes which is what i love about that uh, those atmospheric shots just eyeing you up for breakfast oh yeah <laughs> this guy we watched you know for hours he just wandered across the sea ice you know wow. just spent ages watching and watching yeah that's the engine so they yeah there's so they're usually do- they're pretty much all doubles toby you have some singles as well or um, a mixture of doubles and singles, yeah. Mostly, mostly doubles. You know, we get a lot of couples, and um, it's often good to sort of uh, mix up the um, experience levels in that way. So, yeah. This is, but yeah, just the coastline is is something stunning, and it is sunny there sometimes too. It's not always misty and cold. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a wild place. It'll do what it does. I like your compass there. So that's an example of the the kind of deck structures you have to slip your camera into, or or place your um, pelly case sort of under. Like there's a there's actually an openable little um, cap just at the bottom of frame where you can actually store things inside a little bit that are accessible while you're paddling. But there's you won't be able to reach that front deck while you're paddling, or or the one behind you necessarily. Some kayaks have a little one just behind you you can reach around. Mm. Uh, compass, yeah, water bottle, little pelly case right where that compass is is the mm. That's the ticket. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, I think that's is. that's kind of that's kind of it, guys. And it probably makes sense to end on a kayaking photo. I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Toby, and um, also the opportunity. And um, yeah, I guess for anyone watching, if you'd like to join us over there, um, feel free to check out the link in the show description and uh, to find out some more information, or you can just get in contact with us directly too. We're very happy to answer any and questions. Toby, what, what's, what's the description for your company website if people want to find out about any of your border trips around the world and, and kind of what you do? The website itself? Yeah. Just uh, www.southernseaventures.com. 
Yep, and we'll put that oh, um, cool. the link in the bottom too. Thanks for letting us indulge as well in, in terms of um, speaking about uh, the workshop side of things. Um, but we also hope that for you, those of you that that um, you know wouldn't be able to make it out there, um, you know that we've still given some great insight into what it's like, you know, taking photos from a kayak and and being into the polar regions. And I certainly have also picked up a few things that I didn't know as well. So um, you know, Toby's expertise yeah, is um, is like privileged. nothing else. And it's privileged not very to have... often you get to talk to a polar expeditioner like that. So um, we do appreciate your time, mate. Yeah, oh, thanks. Like yeah. It's not very often you're going to have someone with Toby's level of expertise on hand to ask a million questions. So hopefully Luke and I have done a reasonable job of asking the kind of questions that most people are going to want to know about. So again, you know, you can use the show as a resource for any time you're considering a more extreme environmental uh, trip of any kind for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You can lean into that. And then, you know, Toby's probably very used to all sorts of curly questions coming his way when people are preparing for trips because it is a, a significant thing to do. It's, it's quite for a lot of people that might be a once in a lifetime adventure and having the confidence and the people that you're going to be guided by and the knowledge to, to be able to pack well and know what kind of equipment you want to do and just to pre-visualize experientially what kind of your, your days are going to be like, which I really appreciated in particular, but what Toby brought us through. And, you know, having seen Toby do this for a long period of time, it's uh, I've learned to really appreciate the decisions he's made in terms of how he designs his trips. And I'm particularly endeared by the, the boat size choice that he's chosen. And it's become really clear to me, um, you know, why that might make a trip even more special and more flexible and more dynamic um, as well. And hats off to Toby, like, the investment and risk in setting up trips like these is actually <laughs> massive. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, you know, have a boat um, available even more, even in the millions sometimes. And, and so it's a, it's a brave and courageous sort of industry in, in the global environment and having watched Toby go through starting this company at the start of COVID just going, Oh my goodness, how's this going to roll? And watching him grow and evolve into the role as a CEO as well. Personally, it's been really amazing for me as a, as a friend and, and um, he still gives me heaps of shit and he doesn't have as much time to go surfing, which is a bit of, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been awesome. <laughs> He's also a dad now. So we've got to thank little King Louie in the background there for not, uh, not interrupting the show. He's given us a bit of grace there. <laughs> He's having a good Absolutely. We got lucky. Yeah. 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 So um, much guys. So Love it. I really appreciate it and um, look forward to catching up soon. Eh? Yeah, right. Well, enjoy the show, everyone. And yeah. um, we, and we can we, um, we can a dream. Yeah, absolutely. And just before we do um, uh, break off, we, we do also have a couple places left for a, a Tarkine workshop that we've just, uh, and well, we're just announcing now, really. Um, and um, we've actually um, sold uh, three places in that. Uh, before we've launched it so um, if you are keen to come to the Tarkine in February uh, next year um, then please um, jump on uh, the website the link will also be in the description um, just uh, link at the website last like last week of February it's um I mean basically the the first one filled out and so quick we didn't we th we already had a waiting list and we thought oh well, I guess we can make up another one and before we even advertise it that was mainly full so it's it's uh it's kind of really exciting to know that um yeah, that the world's opening up and we can be a little bit more confident, at least for now anyway, uh, and stretch our legs as much as we can because it's it's a roller coaster ride the way the world's going. So so the way I'm looking at it is um, let's go for it while we can because we don't quite know what's around the corner and and Absolutely. just get stuck under the adventure and travel while, while, it's, while it's there because we've learned and had a big life experience of what it's like when it's not, uh, as we've all been through. And so I'm pretty excited to stretch my legs a bit for as long as possible <laughs> uh in the and meantime the on one it's pretty fair to say is it, and it's probably worth um if you're keen to come getting onto it quickly because um you know there is um it, it's probably not going to um stay open too much longer no, i would have long. thought so um spots. That's, that's uh, either couples or one. two couple spots or, or singles on that one yeah yeah that's right so um awesome and so yeah Thanks again to Toby um, and um, yeah, feel free to reach out and, and check the links in the description. And if you um, enjoy our show, don't forget, you can also subscribe um, and um, you'll also be able to get some updates from us in terms of what the next shows are and things like that. So um, have a lovely uh, rest of the evening and um, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks time. 
Catch you later, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Cheers, Toby. Thanks, guys. Catch you soon.